Security Enhancement Act. As members are aware, the United States faces many challenges today. The uncontrolled state of our southern border is certainly one of them. President Biden's uh, self-inflicted border crisis continues to wreak havoc across the country. Another is the stark fiscal reality we face. Years of chronic overspending, particularly including the outrageous spending spree President Biden and congressional Democrats went on in 2021 and 22, has exacerbated an unsustainable trajectory. With a national debt of nearly $33 trillion, it's actually over $33 trillion now, um, our balance uh, sheet needs to be addressed. The approaching deadline to pass funding bills to keep the government open and operating after September 30th, uh, just 12 days from today, reiterates the work that needs to be done. Funding the government is, a, uh, is core of our duties in Congress. The process is never easy, and in divided government, notably more difficult. Yet we must deliver on this priority and the other challenges before us if the United States is to continue to prosper now and into the future. To start, Congress can and must address the immediate problem before us. We have two weeks to avoid a shutdown. At the beginning of this Congress, House Republicans committed to the American people that we would change the way Washington does business on appropriations bills. No more would we be handed a 3,000-page appropriations bill the night before we would be voting on it. Instead, we committed to passing all 12 bills through regular order. Unfortunately, the appropriations process is deeply complex, and it takes time. Sadly, we're running out of time to complete our work. The Congress ultimately has a responsibility to fund the government and keep it open and operating to provide needed services to our constituents. That's why the House is taking up the Continuing Appropriations and Border Security Enhancement Act. On the appropriation side, the bill will fund the government for another month to October 31st. That will give us additional time to work with our colleagues in the Senate who have yet to even pass one appropriations bill. But this bill also takes steps to address the other two challenges I mentioned. It sets an overall discretionary budget authority at uh, $1.59 trillion in line with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, Act or FRA. It holds uh, defense and veterans programs harmless, ensuring that we can both continue to defend the nation and care for those who've served. Other discretionary titles uh, will see a reduction of 8% for the duration of the bill uh, in, in compliance with the FRA. These fiscal reforms will help reduce the deficit and help offset the effects of President Biden and congressional Democrats' spending spree. The bill also includes border security measures to help gain operational control over the border and address the many serious security and humanitarian realities stemming from this crisis. Many of these measures build on the solutions House Republicans delivered as part of H.R. 2 earlier this year. I look forward to considering this measure, both here and in the, in the Rules Committee and on the floor this week. We owe it to our constituents to address the crises the nation is facing. The Continuing Appropriations and Border Security Enhancement Act is a major step toward doing so. Our second item is H.R. 1130, the Unlocking Our Domestic LNG Potential Act of 2023. In the past two centuries, the United States has stood tall as one of the world's chief energy producers. In the early part of the 19th century, coal production was dominant and helped unleash America's industrial expansion. Oil drilling and production on a mass scale was invented in Pennsylvania in 1859, revolutionizing our growth trajectory. That spirit of homegrown energy and innovation continues today as natural gas leads the way. The United States is the top producer of natural gas in the world. In my home state of Oklahoma, we're proud to be part of that revolution. Oklahoma is the fifth largest natural gas producing state in the country, with nearly 350,000 jobs in the state tied to natural gas production. Natural gas is a critical part of Oklahoma's economy, as it is to the entire nation. Uh, but there's more to be done, and much of that is being left on the table. When the current House Republican majority took control of this chamber, we committed to unleashing America's energy potential. Today, we take a critical step as the House takes up H.R. 1130. This measure will streamline the permitting process for new liquid natural gas, or LNG, export and import facilities. 
Uh, all too often, proposed new LNG facilities are tied up for years in regulatory red tape. H.R. 1130 will make it easier, cheaper, and quicker to bring such new facilities online. The result is a strong future for our nation, one where we can export more natural gas to our friends and allies around the world, create more jobs at home, and ensure that the United States remains energy independent now and into the future. Finally, today's hearing also covers House Resolution 684, which condemns the governor of New Mexico for her attempt to subvert the Second Amendment and deprive the citizens of New Mexico of their right to bear arms. As members are aware, on September 8th, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham uh, issued an executive order that purported to take away the rights of New Mexicans to open uh, or conceal carry firearms. The governor alleged this was necessary due to a public health emergency. Of course, that claim is, is absurd. There's no public health emergency exception to constitutional rights, and it's ridiculous to suggest otherwise. A constitutional right is just that, a right, and it cannot be subverted at the whim of an elected official. Last week, a federal judge in New Mexico agreed and issued a restraining order putting a stop to this unconstitutional action. Governor Grisham has rightly received condemnation on a bipartisan basis for her actions, and this week's uh, members of the House will have the opportunity to do so officially. I urge all members to join in voting to condemn this unconstitutional and illegal attempt to suppress the Second Amendment rights of American citizens. I now yield to my good friend, our ranking member, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have two weeks, two weeks left before our government shuts down. A shutdown uh, would hurt our nation's seniors, would hurt our veterans, our, our families and children, it would hurt our workers, it would hurt all of our people. But instead of dealing with that, Republicans are stalling for time while trying to get their act together. So our first bill, H.R. 1130, is yet another giveaway to big oil and gas. Not content with the, with the GOP passing the Polluters Over People Act, it seems the fossil fuel industry is on the phone once again asking for another handout and my Republican friends are eager to oblige. This bill removes the requirement that natu natural gas exports be in, the American, be in the American public's interest, allowing adversaries and rivals like China to wreak havoc on our domestic energy supply. Now, I'm old enough to remember earlier this year when Republicans slammed President Biden because China was buying our oil. Now they want to make it easier to sell China our gas. You can't make this stuff up. Then we have HRES 684, a non-binding resolution condemning the governor of New Mexico. This resolution, as you all know, does nothing. It will not go to the Senate. It will not go to the president. It's a press release, more political grandstanding from a party that refuses to take action on gun violence. Republicans say no to background checks, no to closing bump stock loopholes, no to ensuring safe gun storage, no to banning lethal assault weapons. The gun violence crisis kills over 100 Americans every single day. And instead of taking steps to protect their constituents, it's clear Republican members would rather drag their feet and pass bills that do nothing to fix the problem. And of course, we have a continuing resolution that was negotiated between the far right and the extreme far right of the Republican Party. No input from House Democrats, no input from Senate Democrats, hell, no input from Senate Republicans. Certainly nothing from the administration. I can't even tell if anyone from the Appropriations Committee was involved in this deal uh, either. And we are still hearing several House GOP members refuse to support this bill. They say this doesn't go far enough, that, quote, it's a gift to Joe Biden. Are you kidding me? Keeping the government open isn't a gift to Joe Biden. It's our job on behalf of the American people. This CR also rams House Republicans, Republicans' extreme HR2 border bill down everybody's throats, a bill that already passed the House months ago and, by the way, is currently dying in the United States Senate. Now, if that were so important, you'd think their leadership would have talked about it more since then. Or maybe they would be trying to negotiate a path forward in the Senate. But no. In fact, with the 8% funding cut to everything 
except for defense and veterans affairs, this bill actually decreases border security funding. I mean, to be honest, I still can't figure out if Republicans want stronger border security or not. Seem to me, seems to me it's like more of a talking point than an actual plan. I can't stress this enough. This is all a waste of time. Every single one of my colleagues sitting on the other side of the dais knows this. They wasted half a month voting for speaker, another month on gas stoves, another month on book vans, and now we're on the eve of a shutdown and doing nothing to stop it, all because there's a civil war going on in the Republican Party. So far, all I can discern is that the Republican plan to shut down the, the Republican plan is to shut down the government, impeach President Biden, and kick out their own speaker. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome uh, our first panel, Representative Jeff Duncan and Representative Diana DeGette uh, from the Committee on Energy and Con uh, Commerce. Uh, Representative Duncan, uh, welcome back to the Rules Committee, and I welcome your testimony. Well, thank you, Chairman Cole and Ranking Member McGovern for recognizing me to speak in support of H.R. 1130, unlocking our, unlocking our Domestic LNG Potential Act of 2023. This legislation was introduced by my good friend, Representative Bill Johnson, and it was considered through regular order in the Energy and Commerce Committee. H.R. 1130 will restore America's energy dominance and cement our position as a world-leading producer and exporter of natural gas. <clears throat> America is blessed with some of the largest reserves in energy in the world. We have the strongest environmental protections and the best workforce. We do energy production cleaner than anyone else in the world. We believe in free markets, innovation, and the rule of law. With all that going for us, we don't need to rely on OPEC or Russia or Venezuela or Iran for our energy needs. H.R. 1130 will ensure that our children and grandchildren do not have to beg dictators and autocrats for energy, as the Biden administration has done. H.R. 1130 will also give our allies in Europe a crucial lifeline, a safe and reliable supply of natural gas to wean themselves off of Russian gas. In December of 2015, Congress lifted the ban on crude oil exports on a bipartisan basis. Since we lifted the crude export ban, our energy production surged. Millions of jobs were preserved and created. New jobs uh, were created in all 50 states. Our balance of trade improved. In 2019, we became a net exporter of petroleum for the first time since 1952. It's time that Congress lifts the regulatory restrictions that are shifting and stifling America's natural gas production. H.R. 1130 will recreate thousands of jobs here in the United States, encourage the expansion of clean American natural gas, and help reduce emissions globally by allowing our allies overseas to stop using dirty Russian fuel. H.R. 1130 contains strong protection to ensure that American natural gas will not go to state sponsors of terrorism or sanctioned countries like China. H.R. 1130 will advance U.S. global leadership and strengthen our economy. This bill is a win-win for the American people. I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide a statement here, and I encourage all my colleagues to join me in support of this legislation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at that uh, appropriate time, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I recognize my good friend, uh, Ms. DeGette from Colorado. Welcome back, and you're recognized for your testimony. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the ranking member as well. Before I talk too much about why I oppose H.R. 1130 on, um, on the um, grounds on, on the grounds of the bill itself, I want to talk for a minute about why we're all sitting here today. H.R. 1130 has already passed the House two times, once as a part of H.R. 1 and the second time when it was included in H.R. 2811, both highly partisan bills that were dead on arrival in the Senate. Unfortunately, I fear this standalone version will suffer the same fate. So why do the Republicans keep bringing up this highly partisan bill? Because, frankly, they have nothing else to put on the floor. The government, as, as the ranking member said, the government is going to shut down on October 1st if we don't pass a stopgap continuing resolution, or as some of us might prefer, an omnibus bill that'll take us through the rest of this, uh, of this fiscal year. But the majority doesn't have the votes for that. They also don't have the votes, as the chairman pointed out, to pass any of the remaining 11 appropriations bills that have yet to advance through the House. So while the entire country and government is held hostage, waiting for the Republicans to make up their minds, 
it looks like that some of their greatest hits from earlier this Congress are going to come to the floor again. And I want to be clear, H.R. 1130 is emblematic of the bills that we've considered so far this Congress, and I am sad about that. This bill benefits China while making energy more expensive for Americans. It doubles down on a de dependence on fossil fuels that benefits nobody except for big oil and gas. And it's a solution in, charge, in search of a problem. If people wonder why LNG terminals aren't being built, they should wonder why facilities that have all of their permits, authorizations, and environmental reviews can't manage to finish construction and export more gas than more than seven years after they receive their authorizations from the Department of Energy. The bill eviscerates one of the few protections for consumers in the Natural Gas Act. Right now, anybody who wants to export LNG to a country that the U.S. doesn't have a free trade agreement with has to get approval from DOE, stating that the export is in the public interest. That's it. It's not an onerous requirement, but this bill completely removes that protection, meaning that the domestic natural gas market will become exactly like the domestic oil market, the Wild West. This would mean that the price of natural gas here in the U.S. would become more exposed to the decisions of the largest natural gas producers in the world besides us, Russia, Iran, and China. Now, anybody who's tired of Vladimir Putin and OPEC dictating the prices they pay at the pump should be terrified of the price of manipulation making its way into their heating and into their electricity bills. That's exactly who this bill would benefit. It would especially benefit China. In 2021, China was the second biggest recipient of U.S. LNG. Earlier this year, Chinese LNG purchasers were snapping up any long-term deal they could find from American LNG exporters. And the reality is that increasing LNG exports does have an impact on domestic consumer costs. When we had our legislative hearing on this bill, which was well over six months ago, we heard from a witness who directly tied LNG exports to domestic natural gas prices that impact everybody. Last year, when an explosion knocked one of the biggest LNG export facilities in the U.S. offline, you immediately saw that in natural gas prices fell by over 10%. Even last week, there was an article tying a 2% decrease in natural gas prices to an announcement that the facility would export slightly less than expected. I do want to flag for the committee, there were two amendments filed that would severely limit the worst consequences of this bill as currently written. The first would pause implementation of the bill's changes until DOE could certify that it would not increase natural gas prices. My amendment, the second one, would reinstate the public interest test for LNG exports to Russia, Iran, North Korea, and China. I think these amendments would be vital to limiting the worst impacts of the bill, and I urge the Rules Committee to make both in order. As written, the bill would increase prices for consumers and potentially support Russia, China, and Iran. It's a lose-lose, and that's not even touching upon the greenhouse gas emission impacts of further double, doubling down on the fossil fuel infrastructure. The bill's not pro-American. It's not pro-consumer. It would just prop up the big oil and gas trading profits at the expense of everyday Americans. So I urge opposition to the bill, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll withhold my questions uh, for the moment. Uh, gentleman from Texas, my good friend, the distinguished vice chairman of the Rules Committee, Dr. Burgess, recognized for any questions he may have. Thank you, Chairman Cole. Thanks to our witnesses for being here. Uh, chairman Duncan, if I recall correctly, when we had the legislative hearing on this and the issue was brought up about the, uh, the gas plant in Texas going down, it was only a blip that the, where the supply was interrupted. I mean, it was back online in a very short period of time. And in, in fact, over the over the long term, it did not affect prices at all. Do I recall that correctly? I recall it the same way you do. Yes, sir. All right. Well, let me just say, uh, I was happy to vote for this in subcommittee. I was happy to vote for it in full committee. <laughs> I'll be happy to vote for it again on the floor. The only missing piece I see is the 
pipeline permitting bill to help get the stranded gas from the Permian Basin to Freeport, Texas, so we can liquefy it and send it off as, as uh, liquefied freedom to our allies and friends around the world. But thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes my good friend, distinguished ranking member, for any questions he may have. Yeah, I'll, let me just be brief. I, I want to uh, thank the um, ranking member for her comments. Um, and um, we have done this before, as she's pointed out, not once but twice. Uh, the House has acted on this, this legislation. Um, I expect that the fate of this bill will be the same uh, fate of the previous efforts to move it forward, and that is nothing. Uh, again, I would just say to my colleagues, um, you know, we, we ought to be seriously trying to figure out a way to avoid a government shutdown in two weeks, and this is not how you do it. Um, but whatever. Um, I mean, I, it is, it's kind of pointless to ask questions. Uh, but I do. It's great to see both of you, and um, and I hope we don't see you again on this anytime soon. Uh, I yield back. My good friend, gentle lady from Minnesota, is recognized for any questions she might have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, just real quickly, um, Mr. Duncan, uh, um, can you maybe talk about? You know, I really appreciate the fact that we're we're getting rid of or, or lessening regulations on anybody because that's one of the um, things that concerns most people about government is the overregulation. And uh, uh, maybe you can talk about the opportunity cost of these regular, uh, uh, regulatory reviews and maybe talk about what's been left on the table um, given that producers are, you know, have been tied up with this bureaucracy. Well, that's no secret that the Biden administration from day one has had a war on fossil fuel production in this country. In fact, President Biden, as candidate Biden, talked about ending fracking and going after the fossil fuel industry. Uh, just prior to that administration, we were a net, ex net exporter of uh, crude oil around the world. We had a robust and growing energy sector. You know, we have to address production of the natural resources we have in this country. Uh, American-produced natural gas is cleaner burning than any other natural gas in the world, can be exported to help our allies in Europe lessen their dependence on Vladimir Putin's oligarch. Uh, we already see they're looking west to the U.S. to export that. We just can't export it fast enough for them. So they contract with Norway to build a pipeline in one year from Norway to Poland to deliver natural gas. Think about the expedited permitting process and, and that to go under the ocean to bring natural gas from Norway to Poland when we could provide it here if we can expedite the export terminals. But American-produced natural gas needs to be delivered. We have got to address, as uh, Mr. Burgess said, uh, pipeline permitting reform so we can deliver natural gas to where it can be utilized by our utilities here at home and can be exported to our friends and allies. If you want to approach this from a climate standpoint, just go read the Progressive Policy Institute's paper on the need to build out pipeline infrastructure and export terminals because they could export natural gas to places like Vietnam, let them take their coal-fired power plants converted to natural gas and lower their carbon emissions, just like the United States has done. The reason we're a leader in the world in global and our carbon emissions is because of cleaner burning U.S. produced natural gas. The Biden administration directed the DOE to push green, in, green energy initiatives uh, at the detriment of fossil fuel production in this country. Our producers in the Marcellus in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, and North Dakota can produce American resources, deliver those resources, lower energy calls for transportation fuel and utility production and also help our friends and allies and others around the world that want to lower their carbon emissions as well by cleaner burning natural gas but have to have a good regulatory environment that allows the industry to prosper thank you very much and i appreciate the fact that you are continuing to work to to getting rid of unnecessary regulations and i appreciate your efforts on this and with that i yield back mr chair <laughs> chair thanks to the gentle lady the gentle lady yields back chair recognize recognizes the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Thank you. So as mentioned, this is the third time in as many months that the Rules Committee has convened purportedly to consider some legislation to fund the government. And based on reporting as we gaveled in, uh, this week's effort is going to go the same way as the last two have, which is um, it won't pass. We won't even get the rule to the floor. And like the last two efforts, the committee now has to consider um, very minor bills, bills that have already passed before, bills about bats and gas stoves, and now we've got a bill that has already passed the House twice, as I understand it. So I am forcibly reminded of the movie Groundhog Day, where poor Bill Murray has to repeat Groundhog Day over and over and over again 
until he learns to do better, because he does take the opportunity to learn from his mistakes over time. And rather than just repeating those mistakes, he becomes a better person, works with the people in the town where he is, and eventually has some success. So I would just, you know, let's try to work on the end result of Groundhog Day. It'd be great if our colleagues across the aisle could come to the table and actually work with um, the rest of Congress <laughs> and the Senate and the White House instead of perpetuating the same mistakes. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, Chair. Thanks, Gentlelady. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky. Gentleman has no questions. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado. I thank the, I thank the chairman and uh, thank you uh, to the uh, uh, ranking member and uh, the chairman or designees uh, for purposes of uh, today's hearing for your testimony. I just want to expound a bit and perhaps give uh, you, Mr. Duncan, an opportunity to respond uh, on a point that Ms. Deget has raised, that uh, Ms. Scanlon has raised, that the ranking member has raised, which is. H.R. 1130 has passed the House twice. Is that right? Portions of H.R. 30 were included in H.R. 1, I believe. I'm not sure about the second but one. But let me just clarify. I'll go my, with it, yes. My understanding is we'll that go with it. Yeah. The, the bill, in its entirety, and maybe someone can clarify that's not the case, and I know you have staff here that are with you, passed as part of H.R. 1 earlier this year and passed as part of, a portion of it passed as part of the Save, Limit, Save, Grow Act. So on two separate occasions, this committee has considered this bill. The House has considered this bill. It has passed the House. Why are we here? What are we doing? Why are you back in front of this committee asking this committee to consider this bill for the third time when government funding runs out in seven legislative days? Well, it shows the importance of um, addressing the energy sector in this uh, nation. Because the Biden administration's war started on day one in his administration. His war on American energy production has cost consumers. It's cost them at the pump. It's cost them through inflationary prices because there's trickle down from transportation fuels uh, all the way down to what you buy at the grocery so to store. That, to your and end. so this shows that this is important to the Republican majority to actually uh, jumpstart the American energy if sector that's the case, once Mr. again. Mr. Duncan, if that's the case... Why hasn't the House, why hasn't the Republican majority sent H.R. 1 to the Senate? H.R. 1 is sitting at the desk downstairs. House Republicans refuse to send it to the United States Senate so that it can consider the bill that you apparently believe is the most important priority of the House Republican caucus. Why haven't I, they done that? I'd have to check with the Speaker on Is that. your plan to come back here next week again with this bill after the House has passed I'd be it? fine with that. This is, this is I'd be how fine with House bringing HR1 back up. I'd be fine with bringing energy, energy bills we've already passed or future energy bills back to this Rules Mr. Committee, Duncan. back to the House floor, and pass them out and what show is the, the American what is people the point what we believe about bills. American energy production. What is the point of passing bills and then not sending them to the Senate so that they can actually get enacted into law? I don't That's understand. That's a question for Speaker McCarthy. And well, I hope he answers it because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand why the House Republican Caucus Look, I get it. I understand. You are very passionate about this bill. Everyone can tell. That's evidenced by the fact that you passed it back in March and then passed it again back in May. The, the lunacy of continually coming back to this committee and asking us to consider a bill that you've already passed. You, you, you did it. Why are you here again? I mean, that, why not consider other bills, perhaps maybe a bill to fund the government? That might be something that comes within the jurisdiction of this committee and would be prudent for this committee to consider Sorry, doing we feel in light of We're the government funding time, shutdown. But, um, so, Mr. Gett, I, it sounds like you might have... Uh, well, I, I just wanted that. to... Mr. Nagus, I just wanted to correct the record um, because my, my colleague and friend, the chairman of the subcommittee, said that um, U.S. oil production has been suffering under the Biden administration... I myself, and I think most of the Democrats here, think we should move to clean renewable energy. But CNN reports that U.S. oil production has, quote, shattered all-time records under Biden with more production than the Trump administration, and it's projected to be 12.8 million barrels a day. But what this, bill, what this bill does, this bill doesn't really have anything at all to do with oil production. And it also doesn't really have anything at all to do with natural gas production. What this bill does is it amends the Natural Gas Act to remove the requirement 
that DOE conduct a public interest review if we're going to export natural gas to countries that the U.S. doesn't have a free trade agreement with, like, like China and countries like that. And so what this bill would actually do is it would harm the consumer in the U.S. because it would eliminate that public interest requirement. I, and that's why the bill didn't go anywhere the two times that it went to the Senate and, the, and why it wouldn't, wouldn't um, make any, it wouldn't make any changes if it went to the Senate this time. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Mr. Gitt, and I'm glad you made that point because I read with great interest the, the background uh, in terms of the committee proceedings that you all had and, and Mr. Chairman, that you held with respect to this bill and the amendment that Ms. DeGette proposed that I thought was a pretty reasonable amendment. I was quite surprised to read that Republicans had rejected it. The, the amendment, as I understand it, and Ms. DeGette can clarify if I'm misconstruing this, simply altered the bill to limit or prevent exports of liquid natural gas to the People's Republic of China, North Korea, Russia, or Iran. That's it. And that amendment was defeated in your well, not in the subcommittee, I should say, the full committee, is my understanding. Care to respond to that or, or maybe explain why that, why you well, want Well, both this amendment? administration, last administration, uh, already has um, sanctions against those countries that prohibit that. There was no need for legislative action. So I, explain that to me because I, I read the technical language in the bill, the statutory language of the bill. It makes very clear that any state that has been designated a state sponsor of terrorism by the Secretary of State, pursuant to a variety of laws that we've enacted in the Congress, uh, that those countries are still banned from potentially accepting, uh, or rather transacting, with respect to LNG and the United States exports of them. China is not on that list. Are they a on state the sponsor of, of terrorism? List. What was that? Are they a state sponsor of terrorism? I am saying to you, they are not. They have not been designated as such by the Secretary of State. That's precisely why Ms. Deget proposed an amendment to ban the export to China. And I'm trying to understand why Republicans opposed it. Well, there's already sanctions in place by the administration and the last administration, probably previous administrations prior to the Trump administration, uh, that bans that. The whole point is to remove regulations on the exportation, importation of natural gas uh, to assure Americans can realize the benefits of increased production here and supply. We've got allies in Europe that are begging for you to us produce natural gas, more export. This amendment, and, this amendment doesn't address them. I, that's what I'm saying, Mr. Duncan. I, look, I, I understand look, your Like I said, it. there are already sanctions in place. I've re the statutory language does not, it's, China is not subsumed by that language. That's why Ms. Get introduced the amendment. And so I, and maybe we can get some clarification from, this is, this is a question made in good faith. The point is, I suspect that you share my belief that China shouldn't, be receiving these exports, right? So if that's the case, let's find a way to ensure that this bill actually achieves that outcome because that's China's not- China's one of the largest economies. Asia's got one of the fastest growing economy areas in the world, right? China's building a new coal-fired power plant every 30 days for generation. Would you not also believe that if they would import American-produced cleaner-burning natural gas and not build coal-fired power plants, it would be better for the environment? So that- is an honest answer. That's the, that's what I was hoping you would say because at least you can concede. Yes, the bill allows. China, Hold on, Vietnam, Mr. Duncan, let me no, finish. I didn't. I said let that me the, my uh, the administration Mr. already has Mr. sanctions Duncan, in place. Let me finish my statement and then I'll give you a chance to respond. Yeah. That's the point. I'd like to have an intellectual exchange in which you know yeah. you can make the argument on the the merits as you've done as to why you believe that exports should go to China. That's your prerogative to make that argument. Ms. Get made an argument that they should not, and she proposed that in the bulk of an amendment. That amendment was rejected by your majority on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I, I don't think that that reflects the majority view of the American people. I think most folks would agree with Ms. Get and myself that exports should not be going to those four countries. Uh, but, you know, again, you're, you're entitled to that view. I would just simply say, you know, to the, to the extent that this bill is, is being argued as somehow being to the benefit of consumers, it's bellied by the fact uh, that the organizations who are lobbying the Congress on this particular bill are not consumer organizations. We, you know, for those who might be tuning into the Rules Committee, they can Google it, they can go on Open Secrets, they can see a list of the various entities and special interest organizations that are lobbying on this bill. I can assure you, they are not consumer organizations. I, I took a list. Uh, you want to, you know, gather to perhaps make a guess as to the type of organizations that are lobbying on this bill? There were 12 that I found. 
I haven't been lobbying on the bill, so. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that, but I, I will just tell you, the groups that have filed public disclosures indicating that they are lobbying on this bill include Enbridge Incorporated, it's a Canadian multinational pipeline and energy company headquartered in Calgary, the Independent Petroleum Association of America, ConocoPhillips, the American Exploration and Production Council, you know, the list goes on and on. There's a reason that these where, companies Where does are, Burisma stand? Why they were, I didn't see them on Open Secrets, but, um, I, you know, I, I don't know if, that, if, if they're in support of the bill, if Mr. Massey, I, I take it Mr. Massey is going to vote for this bill, so I'm not so sure that uh, that, that question uh, is, is in his favor. But in any event, uh, I'll give him an opportunity to, to answer that if he'd like. Bottom line, the point being, the definition of an insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome. And Energy and Commerce Committee, my understanding, I'm not on the committee. I understand it's a very important committee with jurisdiction that extends across our country. And I, I don't understand why the committee is before this committee yet again asking us to consider a bill that we've already considered twice, uh, and notwithstanding all the other issues that we're dealing with as a Congress and as a country. But as I said, the Republicans, it's, you know, you have control over the calendar. Uh, you have control over whether bills get sent to the Senate or not after the House has passed them. And so I, I suppose we can keep doing this charade where a committee submits a bill that we've already considered, and this committee moves it to the floor, and the House considers it yet again, and then sits on it and doesn't send it to the Senate because they have no actual intention of wanting the United States Senate to even debate the bill. That, that doesn't seem like the most effective way to run the government. But uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair would uh, always appreciates robust debate. We just remind everybody, both sides out, please try not to speak over one another during the debate just for the sake of our stenographer. <laughs> so with that, I'd recognize my good friend from South Carolina for any questions he might have. <clears throat> you know, I appreciate Mr. Nagis you know, taking I, my, my watch. The goose. The goose. Oh, I'm from Mr. Nagus. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Last 15 minutes for a bill that you say is just Singular, not plural. <laughs> It's just useless taking up this kind of time for a useless bill. But I also find it kind of interesting that my good friends on the opposite side criticize American company as being, I guess, raping the American public. If you look at where the prices have been, gas prices, utility prices, uh, energy prices spiked 29.3% in 2021, further 7.3% in 2022. Gasoline prices have spiked 49.5% in 21. The American people are feeling the effects of this Biden administration um, and what they're doing to our energy supplies in this country. It's a war on the American people. And uh, energy, everyone has to have. And I find it it's interesting that we criticize American companies. I know on the previous administration, Trump administration, these were a, were a fraction of the cost of what these increases were because we're buying it. This administration is buying energy from countries that don't like us. Now, if you like Iran, who this administration just gave $6 billion to, um, I guess, you know, the foreign countries are who this administration likes and will pay hard-earned money that we're having to borrow uh, to, um, to support. You also hear China. He's trying to, uh, there's efforts on the Chinese economy, which is suffering. This administration, yeah, they say yes to China, including flying a balloon over for a week or more. How does that work? But, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Uh, Congressman Duncan, you don't have to explain why this bill comes up. Uh, you know, you keep, uh, there's a lot of bills that come before Congress. You've been in here longer than I have. But there are a lot of bills that come up that stagnant for whatever reason, but you don't quit on them. People are sick of government. They're sick on the uh, rulings, and they're sick on... Uh, on, on America sitting on the energy supplies and then just hamstringing them. And while China is running rampant on, like, as you say, building coal-fired powered plants that um, I don't think are helping the environment. So uh, I applaud you for doing it. We'll see if we can, can move it on and plan to vote for it. And appreciate you bringing it up. Yo back. Thank you. I recognize my good friend. Oh, she's not. She's left. So... Uh, Chair would now recognize my friend from the great state of Texas for any questions he might have for the panel. 
Uh, thank the chairman. Um, a quick question um, to uh, a friend from South Carolina with respect to prices. My my other friend from South Carolina was just talking about. Could you speak a little bit to? We've heard a lot about oh record high production in oil and so forth. Talk a little bit about prices, price impact, what's going on, you know, with respect to gas, oil, because of the constraints of this administration and my Democratic colleagues. Yeah. So from day one, the Biden administration had a war on American energy production. They were very clear on the campaign trail they were going to do that. Uh, they ended production on federal land, offshore federal areas and the OCS. Um, they continued to use the Department of Energy and regulations to push green initiatives at the detriment to uh, oil and gas producers, refiners, uh, through regulatory environment. What we're trying to do is increase production in this country, increase delivery in this country through pipeline permitting reform and a build out of an S structure that's needed vastly. Um, utilize those resources to lower energy prices for Americans by the power companies and then export cleaner burning U.S. produced natural gas to lower carbon emissions but help our friends and allies in places like Europe that are relying on Russia and having to look west and look at other sources for uh, energy. Um, allow more production at home, create jobs. I think the estimate of jobs that would be created here uh, through increased um, energy production is somewhere between 220,000 and 453,000 American jobs by 2040. This LNG exports could add between 50 and $73 billion to the U.S. economy. Produce it here, keep the money here, keep the jobs here, and help lower, lower global carbon emissions by allowing folks like Vietnam or China or anywhere else that wants to buy natural gas on a global market to lower their carbon emissions. India, I can go through a whole litany of countries that we could export gas to to help lower their carbon emissions while also sending it to places like Africa where they can raise their standard of living, actually heat and cool their homes and cook food over cleaner burning U.S. produced natural gas. It just works to produce elect uh, natural gas and oil here in this country, be able to export it to help our friends and allies around the world, keep the money, keep the jobs here, and grow the U.S. economy. There is no national security without energy security, and we can do it through supporting uh, a good export market. I yield back. Energy prices have increased by 39% since Biden took office. Does that sound right to you? Yes. Gasoline up 53%. Gas now 383 a gallon, electricity up 26%. Um, uh, data I have says the United States could increase gas production 50% and LNG exports fourfold over the next decade if allowed to uh, carry out its market potential. That's correct. Um, we talked about China earlier. Uh, better or worse to make China dependent on American natural gas? I mean, putting aside whatever you want to say about it, which, which would be better for our national security and for the world? Uh, to make is it would be better or worse if China were to be dependent on the United States American natural gas, particularly considering that China has 1,100 or so, give or take, coal-fired plants that are producing I don't know two a week, and we have about 250 or so and are producing none. What would you think? Better for us, better for the world, if we had more liquefied natural gas going out and gas production in China consuming it or no? Better for us and better for the world. Lower carbon emissions. And what's ironic about the power plants they're building, coal power power plants they're building, utilizing, they're utilizing to produce electricity to produce the solar panels and the wind turbines and other things that they turn around and sell back to us as we push to lower the American standard of living by last week increasing we our renewables. Witness, last week we had a witness, uh, a Democratic witness, who couldn't answer the question about the fact that uh, batteries uh, for cars, in particular for EVs, uh, that the cobalt that's mined to produce those batteries is heavily mined uh, by slave labor and, and often child labor. Uh, do you find that to be a particularly abhorrent practice and that it might be better to pr live and, and produce uh, America, live off of and produce American energy? I agree with you. And uh, in the mining aspect and the energy aspect, nobody does it cleaner and better and more environmentally sense than the United States of America. China's using uh, child labor and and raping the environment in places like Africa where they mine these critical minerals for the EVs. Um, if we had vastly expanded our ability to export natural gas earlier and weren't constrained by this administration, um, European dependence on Russia for energy would be reduced, correct? That's correct. Uh, gas accounts for about 20% of the EU's power uh, generation, uh, and I believe Russia accounted for about 40% of EU gas consumption. 
Um, in 2020, Russian gas accounted for 48 percent of Europe's natural gas imports. Is it better for our national security? Is it better uh, for us to export liquefied natural gas in order to, I don't know, stick it to Russia? That sounds correct. Um, in uh, 2021, the U.S. became the top LNG exporter to the EU, accounting for 26 percent of total. However, pipeline gas made up 74 percent of EU gas imports. Uh, are the current Democrat administration policies hampering our ability to compete and export LNG on the world stage? They are. Uh, does that uh, increase or diminish our national security? Diminishes our national security. Does that uh, help or hurt, say, Russia and some of our competitors? It supports Vladimir Putin's oligarch and uh, puts money in the pocket to fund the war in Ukraine. Um, overall, I would just suggest on the point about H.R. 1 and having another bill is hardly something new in this uh, institution when we have a larger package that we break off an individual component of it and move it uh, in isolation uh, because of its uh, critical import for the well-being of this country. Not because it's for some particular industry per se. I would ask my colleague one final question. The Inflation Reduction, Reduction Act, talk about the benefit for a specific industry. Uh, do 90% of the uh, subsidies go to about go to billion dollar corporations of the big corporate subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act? Generally in the green initiatives, yes. Yeah, and are the lion's share of the subsidies for EVs and so forth going to families that make up to, to up to multi hundred thousand dollars a year in order to use those subsidies? Sounds correct. Yeah, I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Is there any additional questions? Seeing none, our panel's excused. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We'll see you again next week. <laughs> we could. We'd welcome our second uh, panel uh, to the table, uh, Representative Tom Tiffany and Ranking Member Jerry Nadler of the Committee on Judiciary. Welcome to both of you. It's good to have you here. Representative Tiffany, uh, again, welcome to the Rules Committee, and I welcome your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm here today to talk about the report. And I'll turn my microphone on. <laughs> Thank you very much. HRES 684, would you like me to begin my remarks? Yeah. Thank I you, recognize. Mr. Chairman. The Second Amendment is one of Americans' foundational freedoms the resolution before us recognizes our Second Amendment rights. It condemns the unconstitutional order of New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham that bans New Mexico citizens from carrying firearms in the city of Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. Under the governor's so-called emergency public health measure, violators could face civil penalties of up to $5,000. However, the order has nothing to do with public health and only serves to infringe New Mexicans' rights while not preventing crime or violence. You don't have to take my word for it. New Mexico Attorney General Raul Torres, a Democrat, warned only responsible gun owners are likely to abide by the ban. Bernalillo County Sheriff John Allen, another Democrat, this ban does nothing to curb gun violence. The governor's ban makes no distinction between law-abiding citizens and those who break the law. The ban applies to citizens who have passed a background check and undergone the training necessary to receive a New Mexico concealed carry permit. It relies on the misguided idea that criminals are interested in following the law. This ban is not only bad policy detrimental to public safety, but it is blatantly unconstitutional. The Second Amendment is not a mere suggestion. As the Supreme Court has stated in Konigsberg, the Second Amendment is an unqualified command. In the New York pistol case, just decided a little over a year ago, Americans have a constitutional right to carry a firearm in public for self-defense. It is settled law. In fact, everyone but the governor seems to think it's a settled law, Republicans and Democrats. The New Mexico Attorney General and the Bernalillo County Sheriff have stated the order is unconstitutional. Albuquerque Police Chief Harold Medina said he won't enforce the order. David Hogg, of all people, said there's no such thing as a state public health emergency exception to the U.S. Constitution. Representative Ted Lieu, our colleague, 
I support gun safety laws. However, this order from the governor of New Mexico violates the U.S. Constitution. No state in the union can suspend the federal constitution. The resolution before us today stands in agreement with a statement from these Democrat politicians and left-wing activists. It is a straightforward and common sense resolution, and it should have bipartisan support. This is a rare opportunity for this body to speak with one voice on an issue where clearly Democrats and Republicans are in agreement. I urge all of my colleagues to support this resolution. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ranking Member Nadler, you're recognized for whatever remarks you care to make. Thank you. Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern, and members of the committee, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to testify today about HRES 684. This resolution does absolutely nothing. It does nothing to prevent Republicans from shutting down the government. It does nothing to promote health and safety. It will not make a single American safer from gun violence nor does it have any effect on the rights of responsible gun owners. It is plainly a waste of time intended to distract us from Republicans' failure to responsibly govern. Earlier this year, after a mass shooter killed six people, including three children at a school in Nashville, the Republicans fought to make sure everyone could continue to acquire the accessory that shooter used. Rather than taking a stand against gun violence, they chose to stand with the gun industry. Today we are here to debate this resolution because more Americans, and more children have died from gun violence. Yet Republicans are steadfast in their commitment to promoting more guns in more places, no matter how many lives are lost. Gun violence continues to take the lives of more than 100 Americans every day. More than 30,000 Americans have died from gun violence so far this, just this year, including 1,258 children. This past weekend, the nation experienced its 500th mass shooting this year alone. Gun violence is an epidemic that the governor of New Mexico could not ignore in her state. New Mexico experienced two mass shootings in May. Then additional shootings killed a 13-year-old girl in July, a 5-year-old girl in August, and an 11-year-old boy earlier this month. Following these horrific events on September 8th, Governor Lujan Grisham declared a public health emergency and issued a public health order that took a number of steps intended to reduce gun violence. The order placed a 30-day prohibition on open and concealed carrying of firearms in cities and counties above a certain threshold of violent crime and firearms-related emergency department visits. In practice, just one county met the threshold. The prohibition did not apply to law enforcement or licensed security officers. The order also took several other steps to reduce gun violence, such as requiring monthly inspections of firearms dealers, requiring a report on gunshot victims, and providing every firearm owner with a free trigger lock among the other actions. On September 13th, a judge issued a temporary restraining order that suspended portions of the order. And on September 14th, even though the order was already suspended and under review, Republicans introduced this resolution to condemn the governor for her effort to reduce gun violence. On September 15th, Governor Lujan Grisham issued a new public health order to replace the old one. Under this new order, concealed and open carry is only prohibited in public parks and playgrounds. This does not include designated state parks. Again, law enforcement and licensed security officers are exempt. And again, the governor has taken other actions to direct additional resources to prevent gun violence. Even though, the, even though the new order only applies to public parks and playgrounds, Republicans are still proceeding with this political stunt. Apparently for Republicans, it is too much to ask for even our playgrounds to be free from gun violence. By this point, last Congress, House Democrats had already passed bills to require universal background checks and to close the Charleston loophole, bills that would keep guns out of dangerous hands. We built on those efforts by later passing a federal red flag law, a renewed assault weapons ban, the Protecting Our Kids Act, and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first major gun safety law in decades. Republicans, on the other hand, are giving us essentially a press release, one that condemns the government for doing something anything to protect their citizens from gun violence. How pathetic. Ultimately, Governor Lujan Grisham's executive orders are a matter for the courts to examine, although unfortunately they will do so based on law that Republicans have repeatedly dragged toward the interests of the gun lobby through radical judges indifferent to the lives lost to gun violence. As Republicans rush headlong towards a government shutdown, uneven, unable even to manage the most basic aspects of governing, and as they continue to oppose every action to prevent gun violence, we will continue to fight to make our community safer for every American. 
Ultimately, this matter will be decided in the courts. A resolution from Congress is a waste of time and simply diverts Congress from its duties of keeping the government running. I urge my colleagues to oppose this preposterous resolution, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Chair has no questions. Uh, recognize Dr. Burgess for any questions he may have. I really don't have any questions. I want to thank uh, my friend for bringing this to us in such timely fashion. It obviously is important. I know I've heard from a number of constituents back home in Texas who were terribly worried about what we saw our next door neighbor doing. Um, I will use your statement about uh, how did you phrase it? Criminals are not interested in following the law. That's why they're criminals. By definition, they're lawbreakers. Uh, and yet what we do is make it harder for the law-abiding citizens to actually protect themselves from the criminals who seem to be becoming more and more aggressive. So I think this is an important concept, and I, if you have anything you want to add to that, but I, I'm grateful that you brought it before us today. Thank you for your support. Ranking member is recognized for any questions well, he may have. Well, thank you. Just a, just a few. Um, uh, Mr. Tiffany, I just want to be clear. What we have here today is a non-binding resolution. Am I correct? That's correct. Right. And um, so this resolution, uh, th does this resolution have any tangible impact on policy in New Mexico or in the United States? Uh, does it change the law in any way? It sends a clear message that we will defend the Second Amendment to the Constitution here in the United States so Congress. I, so I, since you didn't answer my question, I assume the answer is no. This doesn't change the law in any way. And assuming this is passed by the House, will this bill be sent to the Senate? I can't answer that question. But I don't know. These bills, each uh, reses for, uh, don't go to the Senate. Um, so it would not be. And I would hopeful, be hopeful that the Senate would take up a similar resolution and, and craft it and, themselves. And the answer is, if this bill were, uh, if this were passed, would it be signed into law by the President? Uh, no, because it wouldn't get there. But, uh, but what, I'm, okay, what I'm hearing here is that uh, this res resolution effectively does nothing. Um, as Mr. Mallor said, it's a press release. Nothing to influence policy, nothing to reinforce safe gun ownership, nothing to protect our constituents from the real threat of gun violence. I mean, if we really wanted to take action, you know, maybe we could consider a number of bills that have been introduced that, quite frankly, uh, would actually protect people uh, from the proliferation of gun violence in this country. But I just want to point out, uh, uh, about a month ago, 110 Democratic members of this House sent a letter to Speaker McCarthy asking him to do something on gun violence, even if he just allows a vote on any of the bills uh, that have been introduced by a number of our colleagues. And I'd like to insert that letter in the record at this point. Without objection. And I say this because I, I, I hear Dr. Burgess um, uh, on a regular basis complain about uh, his frustration when he doesn't get responses uh, to letters from the administration and from others. Um, and I, you know, and I, and I share that frustration with him uh, when I think, it's, I think people do deserve a response, even if the response is something I don't want to hear. But we never even get the courtesy of a response, uh, not even an acknowledgment. Instead, um, what we get is this non-binding resolution, which is really a glorified press release. And uh, I, it, it is, to me, an embarrassment. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I would urge my colleagues to please stop talking about this issue unless you want to get real about passing bills that, aggr that address the gun violence problem that we have in this country. Uh, and, you know, I don't know why um, Speaker McCarthy can't even, I mean, if, if the answer is no, the gun lobby won't let me bring a bill to the floor. So that's why, I mean, that's an answer, at least, you know, an, maybe an honest answer. That's at least something, but not even an acknowledgment. Um, and by the way, it's not just 110 Democratic members. I mean, there are millions of people all across this country who are wondering why, when it comes to this problem, we do nothing. Um, and um, and anyway, I see you on the floor. You're back. <laughs> the gentlelady from Minnesota is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first, I would just like to say, Mr. Tiffany, if you wanted to respond at all to uh, to the ranking member, otherwise uh, you don't have to. I, I would just give a brief comment in the testimony. Bernalillo County Sheriff John Allen, another Democrat, stated bluntly, this ban does nothing to curb gun violence. And thank you very much. And I appreciate the fact that you are here 
in order to protect our Second Amendment constitutional right. Um, and so I appreciate that. Um, whether or not, you know, it's, uh, it uh, does what, uh, or it has anything to do with what Mr. McGovern was talking about, I think the clear message is, is that we are here to protect people's constitutional rights. And that's what I appreciate about this. And uh, so I'm fully supportive. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she may have. Thank you. Uh, so House Republicans are wasting Congress's time with yet another resolution that doesn't address real problems in this country. This resolution essentially amounts to finger wagging by the House at a state governor over a policy that's already been blocked by the courts and rescinded by the governor. So the more fundamental issue is why the governor and so many of our state and local officials have felt compelled to deploy extraordinary measures to combat gun violence. And the pretty clear answer is because Congress hasn't done its job. Gun violence has reached crisis levels all across this country in red states and blue, largely because of easy, unfettered access to guns, whether traditional firearms, ghost guns, or weapons of war. Gun violence is, as has been noted, the leading cause of death for children in this country. But Congress has failed to act on common sense, constitutional gun safety measures like universal background checks, safe storage laws, and an assault weapon ban. These bills are ready and waiting for action. And I urge our colleagues across the aisle to have the courage and honesty to put these bills on the floor for a vote. Uh, as the ranking member referenced, uh, over 100 members of the House have sent a letter to the Speaker asking for a vote. And I joined my colleagues in that letter. Every day, too many Americans die from gun violence. Our communities are safer when there are fewer guns on the street and their use is restricted to responsible gun owners. There are fewer murders, there are fewer suicides, and there's less crime. And the Second Amendment does not preempt many of the laws I have just referenced which would improve public safety while respecting the constitutional rights of lawful gun owners. The majority of Americans are incredibly frustrated that Republicans in the gun lobby have blocked votes on all of these laws. We need responsible legislators to pass responsible laws to reduce gun violence and crime and to fund the federal government. Those are the bills we should be voting on this week not this pathetic attempt to distract from the House majority's inability to perform its most basic constitutional duties. I yield back. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for any questions he might have for the panel. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask Ranking Member Nadler, do you think that Governor Lujan Grisham had the authority to issue the original order? I think so, but my... I think so, but my opinion is not important. What is important is that it's going to be settled by the courts in, in, uh, in New Mexico, by the federal court there or the state court there, whichever. And uh, Congress has no business uh, uh, passing a meaningless resolution in this respect. The courts will decide. I'm glad you brought up the courts because in your opening statement, you said that uh, the situation we're in is due to radical judges, something to that effect. I did. Um, so there's only one judge at issue here in this case, and that's Judge David Urias, who is, uh, th that's the one who put the stay against this uh, executive order by the governor. Is he a radical judge? Is that who you were I, talking about? No, no, I don't know anything about uh, Judge Urias. He's a local judge in, in uh, New Mexico. And uh, I, doubt it'll, I doubt it'll stop with him. It'll probably go to the to higher courts. He's, he's a, actually a federal judge. Okay, I, don't, I still don't know anything about him. He's a federal okay. judge in New Mexico. Well, let me, Undoubtedly, it'll be appealed. Well, then this will be news to you. He was appointed by President Biden. Okay. That's very nice. Okay. So I just, whatever he decides, I assume, will be appealed to higher courts. When, you, when I heard you say that um, radical judges you know, led to this situation, I, meant, I, I thought you might have meant this judge that was appointed by no, President Biden. No, I meant Biden. the Supreme Court judges. Okay. Um, you're calling them all radical? No, just uh, six of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So do you think the judge, this federal judge who was appointed by Biden, erred in his, since you think that Lujan Grisham, uh, Governor Lujan Grisham had the authority to do this, do you think the judge ruled in error when he uh, issued the injunction? I, I don't know. I think the higher courts will decide that. Uh, my, my main point is to the courts, not to this body. We are, uh, we should be passing a budget. We should be saving the, uh, uh, dealing with the country's budget, uh, to dealing uh, with uh, um, um, giving uh, disaster aid and giving aid to Ukraine and, and uh, restoring the child tax credit so the child poverty rate doesn't uh, double. That's what we should be doing instead of passing silly resolutions that have no impact. So uh, one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle here said that this order was rescinded, and I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, it was, the original order may have been rescinded, but it was reissued, um, and I think you noted this in your chronology. And I think it was a slightly different version. But. A slightly different version. So it's not been rescinded. This isn't a moot thing that we're voting on. No, but, but the courts will decide it. What's moot, what, what, what is silly is Congress has no business and, and uh, you know, Mr. Um, uh, my colleague here said that, Mr. Tiffany said that Tiffany. he hopes the, uh, the, 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 the um, Senate will, will concur in this. The Senate will most certainly not concur in this. Everybody here knows that. Um, and we should be letting the courts decide this question, and we should be devoting ourselves instead of just to silly resolutions, uh, not wasting our time, and that we should be de de uh, devoting ourselves to the problems in front of this country. Well, I actually think it's not clear that the Senate wouldn't vote for this because I believe we may have some House Democrats vote for this. Do you think our distinguished colleague on your side of the aisle who serves on the Judiciary Committee who condemned these actions by the governor, do you think he was in the wrong? I'm not going to comment on him. I just think it, 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 uh, it is clear that this will not come up on the floor of the Senate. If uh, White Chuck Schumer would bring this up on the floor of the Senate if they got pressing business, uh, unlike Mr. McCarthy, who seems to think we don't have pressing business, I'm sure he won't bring it up. Well, they have certain uh, procedures in the Senate that are different than over here, and occasionally members of the minority are able to bring up votes as amendments, and uh, you, it could be that somehow this does get a vote. And I think it'd be very interesting to see how all the Democrats over there vote. It's going to be interesting to see how Democrats here vote, because at least one of them on our Judiciary Committee has condemned what this governor did, uh, and it's still in effect. There's still a version of it in effect, so it's not been completely uh, mooted or rescinded. Um, is there a law in New Mexico that allows the governor to ban the carry of firearms in public parks and playgrounds? I don't know if there's a specific law. I'm not an expert on the laws of New Mexico. But it, what I do know is that N neither are most people in this house, and therefore we shouldn't be, should leave it to the courts in New Mexico or the federal courts, and we shouldn't be uh, getting involved in this. I think, our, you know, there's, a, there's an issue here that I think is important. There's the issue of the Second Amendment, and I want to get into that later with my uh, colleague, colleagues, uh, but there's also an issue of the Constitution guarantees each state has a Republican form of government, and they don't mean that you have to elect Republicans in no. those states. Clearly. Clearly, <laughs> not they haven't in New Mexico. What they mean when they say they have a Republican form of government is that um, it's similar to the structure of the federal government here, that there are three branches, and you have one branch that's the courts, one, one branch is executive, and one branch is legislative. And in the legislative body is vested lawmaking. That's what I interpret the U.S. Constitution to say when it binds each state to have a Republican form of government. They couldn't have simply an executive who makes the laws and then enforces the laws. That would be banned by our Constitution. Yet, regardless of what you think about the Second Amendment, I think there's a violation here of that directive in the Constitution that each state has a Republican form of government, small r, Republican. Uh, but let me move on to uh, well, before we go to that, let me let me say I think you said this was a 30-day order uh, in your opening statement, or or maybe one of my colleagues over there said it was 30-day order. I just wanted to clarify. I think it's it it's an at least 30-day order. An indefinite order, and the federal 
the federal judge, to your point, uh, Ranking Member Nadler. Now, this was a 30-day prohibition, not, not, uh, not, not longer than that. I mean, she may renew it, but it's a okay. 30-day prohibition. But the, so the judge, in this case, said the violation of a constitutional right, even for minimal periods of time, unquestionably constitutes irreparable injury. So for us to sit back and say, oh, we'll let the court sort this out, I mean, if they had received a different decision there in New Mexico, you would have uh, a large number of people being deprived of a constitutional right. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah, please, yeah. at any point. What we do here will have no impact at all. It's a statement of our opinion, and that's it. What will determine the rights of gun owners in, in, in New Mexico, uh, she put in a 30-day, uh, uh, the governor put in a 30-day order, the courts in New Mexico will decide whether to enforce that order or not, period. What we do here <coughs> has no impact on that whatsoever. Well, in our committee, which <coughs> you and I both serve on the Judiciary Committee, uh, one of the subcommittee's topic is the, the Constitution. And um, what, what is at stake here is an issue of the Constitution. I've already mentioned that uh, Republican form of government that's guaranteed in the Constitution is but no one. Is no one is denying a Republican here. form of government. The courts, they have three branches of government. The executive has taken an action. If that executive action was improper, the courts will, will take care of it. The, uh, uh, with all due respect, the executive here is making law. And, well, the uh, executive is making a ruling which the court will get rid of if the court deems it improper. I would just say that the uh, moving on to the Second Amendment issue here, not just the, the violation of the base text of the Constitution, but to the Second Amendment, uh, since the McDonald versus Chicago decision, the Second Amendment has been clearly accepted as a restraint on state governments. Isn't that well, since correct? Since the New York Bruin decision. Isn't that correct, Mr. Tiffany? That is correct. So the, the Heller decision guaranteed or asserted, the court asserted that it was an individual right, not some right of the National Guard to keep and bear arms, and it applied to uh, all Americans. But the McDonald decision, which I think was about two years later, uh, bound the states to the Second Amendment through, I believe, the incorporation doctrine. So when I first saw this case, I wondered, okay, do we really have a role here? And Obviously, I thought back, yes, the McDonald uh, case uh, makes it clear that the Second Amendment is binding on state governments and state officials, like Governor Lujan Grisham. And um, so I think we do have a role here, even if it is not a binding resolution. I'd prefer to have a binding resolution. I'd prefer to uh, basically enforce this so that the people don't have to wait for years for this case to trickle up to the Supreme Court. Um, one thing that I uh, wanted to ask you about, I think also in your opening statement, you, you declared that gun violence was an epidemic. Yes. So that's concerning to me when somebody uses that language because Secretary, uh, Secretary Xavier Becerra. Javier. Javier, sorry. Javier Becerra can declare public health emergencies, is that correct? Yes. So if, if, if Secretary Javier Becerra can declare public health emergencies, and you think <laughs> this is a public health epidemic, and I believe the Surgeon General and the, Dr. Fauci has said so as well, and you believe that the governor had the authority to do this, do you also believe that Javier Becerra, Secretary, uh, Javier Becerra has the authority to do the same thing and suspend the sec Second Amendment no, I don't federally. Think, no, I don't think that is the case. I think the um, um, gun violence, as we've seen in this country, is, a, is, a, is, 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 is truly an epidemic. We've seen that, uh, um, I, I know that many Republicans and others have said that uh, the reason we have so many mass shootings in our schools, uh, et cetera, are, is because of mental health problems which I regard as a slander on the American people because I don't think the American people are 75 times as mentally ill as, any, as people in any other country in the world. We have 75 times as much gun violence 
as any other country in the world per capita. Um, but it's not, a, it's not uh, defined as a public health emergency. That was a figure of speech. Um, it's, a, it's an epidemic, but it's not under the jurisdiction of the Department of, uh, of um, um, uh, Health and Human Services. Yeah, I was about to say health, education, and welfare, which dates me. Um, OK, so uh, <laughs> it, was, it, used, it used to be called that. Yeah. OK. Uh, so you do not believe that the Secretary of HHS has the same authority to declare a public health emergency and, and then uh, implement this? Unfortunately, uh, because our laws do not permit that. Had we passed some of those bills that, uh, that were um, passed by the Democratic House last year, um, we could have done a, gone a long way toward eliminating this uh, epidemic. Do, do you think the CDC or HHS has the authority to declare uh, eviction moratorium? Eviction moratorium? Yes, like they did under President Trump and, and President Biden pursued, and then they, uh, the Supreme Court ruled it was not legal or constitutional. Well, if the Supreme Court ruled it was not legal or constitutional, they probably they don't have that authority. I'm not an expert so, on that. So now you agree with the six radical judges? I wish, I wish they hadn't ruled that way, but <laughs> they did. I, I appreciate the, the back and forth here. Um, I want to give you a chance to, to respond, Mr. Tiffany. Uh, did to some of these questions. Did Governor Lujan Grisham have this authority to uh, suspend the Second Amendment? She does not. And uh, does she have the authority to make law? She does not. And, and doesn't our Constitution... And, and let me qualify. Yes, please. She does not unless she is given that authority by the state legislature. I wonder why... If either of you want to respond to this, why do you think she did this on her own, knowing that she may be struck down by a judge when, in fact, uh, she doesn't have that authority? Why not go to the state legislature? Is it particularly partisan legislature? I don't even know the makeup in New Mexico. Is it a, is it a Republican legislature? I have, no, I have no idea what the legislature is in New Mexico. I think she did it because she thought there was an emergency and was trying to do what she could. We do have someone here that knows that. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I defer to Ledger Fernandez. <laughs> do they have a Republican or Democrat Senate and House in New Mexico? We have both Republicans and Democrats in the House and in the Senate in New Mexico. <laughs> and we do, too. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell me who the majority was in those two chambers. In both the House and the Senate, uh, Democrats are Okay. Let me say that again for the record. The wise people of New Mexico have elected Democrat majorities in the House and the Senate. Well, I don't know any of them, but they were wise to send you because you, you contribute a lot to this committee. So, um, I, so I wonder, I'm even more perplexed now that I know that Democrats control both legislatures. Yes, Mr. Tiffany, why she did not go try to go through the legislature and pass this into law. I don't know why, but I want to address one uh, component of this. She did it under a public health emergency. And as you know, um, Mr. Massey, uh, we had uh, a public health emergency that was declared in the United States of America just a few years ago. And we are continuing to dig out from the pain and the consequences of that happening. I think it should concern every American when your constitutional rights are declared to be null and void as a result of a public health emergency. I think it's something very dangerous for our country at this point when you see, in this instance, a governor, when we had just seen this over the last couple years where a public health emergency is declared um, to take away the constitutional rights of Americans. We should never allow that to happen. And by the way, there are Democrats in New Mexico that agree with us. Let me and, just say, and, I do not agree that the actions that were taken to respond to the uh, public health emergency presented by COVID-19 took away any constitutional rights from anybody. Well, the, the courts in Kentucky disagree with you, Ranking Member Nadler, because our governor suspended our rights to go to church, or tried to, in, this, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, sent state troopers to churches where people were congregating, wrote down their license plates, 
and uh, proceeded to try and get the local health officials to take action against these churchgoers. And he was soundly reprimanded by the courts. And, uh, and so there were rights that were suspended during COVID in the, in the name of a public health emergency. And I want to sort of wrap up by saying this. You know, there's a question of whether this should be in front of Congress or should this be an issue for the courts or the people of New Mexico at the, at the next election. I think it's absolutely incumbent upon us to pass this resolution because the federal secretary of health and human services could try something just like this. The CDC could try something just like this. They bandy around words like public health epidemic when they're talking about guns, not a virus. And they're telling you where they're going to go next if we don't nip this in the bud, if we don't vote on a bipartisan fashion, and I do believe this is probably going to be a bipartisan vote in the House, maybe not in the Rules okay. Committee, okay. but we, it's imperative on us, for us to rule on this by a vote, even if it's just a resolution, to say no. The Constitution does not allow you to suspend basic rights, God-given rights, in the name of a public health emergency declared not by a legislature but by an executive so that they can, and, and in the guise of making rules, not laws. And um, so I urge adoption of this uh, rule that will bring this to the floor, and I also support the resolution itself and, and the uh, importance of doing so, and I yield back to the chairman. Thank you very much. General lady from New Mexico is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Tiffany. Nice to see you again. We went on a marvelous Codell uh, over uh, the summer. And thank you, a ranking member. Um, you know, we're, we're, we are the United States representatives. We are Congress. We have federal responsibilities to the American people, the American people including uh, those who are either working for the federal government, relying on what the federal government needs to get done, or in states like mine uh, that require uh, that, you know, and, and depend on yeah. uh, federal action. Uh, but what we've done in the last few weeks here, when we have incredibly important work to do with regards to funding uh, our federal government, is actually spent a lot of time in this uh, chamber attacking the rights of states under existing law to do stuff. We attacked California last week. Uh, this week, we ended up attacking my beloved New Mexico. And the reality is that gun violence is a tragic, tragic matter that affects every single one of our communities. It affects Kentucky as we all cried for those who were killed in Louisville and friends of, you know, colleagues of ours and of, of my extended family there. Uh, Mr. Nadler, what is the biggest cause of death for children in the United States? The biggest cause of death for children in the United States by far is gun violence. And if we want to protect our children, what would be the rational thing to do, given that there are so many deaths by gun in this country? The rational thing to do would be what the House did last year, passing a, uh, a bill to require universal background checks on guns, which we had in this country from 1994 to 2004, uh, passing a, a bill to close the Charleston loophole. Uh, these bills would keep guns out of dangerous hands, a bill to uh, uh, pass a federal red flag law so that people who are uh, a danger to themselves or others, according to a court, can't get a hold of, of guns. A renewed assault weapons ban the, and, the Bi and the Protecting Our Kids Act. Uh, we passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which was a step forward, but a small step compared to what we ought to be doing. I need to tell you, in New Mexico, we were really uh, welcomed the Safer Communities Act. We received some of those grants, and I think it's really important. I look forward to our state continuing to make progress on uh, gun violence, but it's something that we have to do at the congressional level, and that's what it is. Their states can do what they need to do. They will handle that, but what we're talking about is what should Congress do, and if we are really concerned about the safety of our children, 
it is quite apparent what we want to do. And do you happen to know what the uh, American support for universal background checks is? So I think 70 or 80 percent. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think like 90 percent. Universal background check or our communities are asking for that. People who own guns are asking for that. People want to make sure that guns don't fall in the hands of those who shouldn't have it. And the easiest thing is to do a universal background check. Mr. Tiffany, are you a co-sponsor of the universal background uh, check bill that we have in the House that's been introduced in the past or this year? I am not a co-sponsor of the universal background checks. OK. So I think that this is where there is. There are things we can do in Congress that we should be doing, uh, including making sure that we pass uh, a budget uh, and that we have support to actually get, uh, not a budget, but appropriations uh, so that we can continue to do the important work to serve our communities. Uh, and with that, um, Mr. Chair, I yield back and thank you for the time. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. I don't have any questions, but I, I do want to uh, just address Ranking Member Nadler. Uh, we don't agree on pretty much anything, but today I found something that we're in agreement on, and that's maroon suspenders. We're both wearing maroon <laughs> suspenders. Mr. Rank, ranking Member, you have incredible taste today with those suspenders. and right, thank uh, you. It shows if you spend enough time with somebody, you'll find something that you have in common. So with that, I yield back. Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, the gentleman from South Carolina is recognized to try and top that. So... Uh, for any questions he may have for our friends. I think I can yes, top that. <clears throat> I'll be brief. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. My good friends on the left, anytime you talk about gun violence, and any life is, is one too many. Any person that dies, whether you're a child or an adult, is one too many. Uh, but the answer is always just take the guns away. Uh, make the gun laws stricter. Chicago's got some of the strictest gun, gun laws, and they lead the country in homicides. And never do, do I hear mention fact that um, the 100 to 150,000 young people that died last year from fentanyl coming across the border, unfettered. Uh, my good friend from Texas, Chip Roy, was interviewing a, a witness last week and asked about the, is he concerned about the rapes of our young children on, uh, by illegals, and he just didn't care. He just didn't, wasn't, wasn't a concern. It was on his face, which is amazing. Um, I also find it interesting mental illness um, is never brought up. And Ms. Nadler, what was your comment? 75% of no, America? No, no, no. My comment was that it is a slander to say that Americans are 75 times as mentally ill as people in any other country on earth, which is what you're saying if you're saying that mental illness is the cause of all these gun deaths rather than the proliferation of guns. Who, who said, who, who quoted that, you that number? I don't remember. I've seen it all over. See, that's, that's absurd. You're even saying no, that. Not absurd. Uh, it's the fact. No, it's absurd because it's, I mean, ask any, any of the killers in this country uh, that, particularly that mow down children in schools, they're mentally ill. And uh, who else would do something like that? And I, I think it's um, unbelievable. And yeah, there are mentally ill people in every society, but in all other societies. They don't get guns if they're mentally ill. Here they do. Well, that, that's your answer. Take, take the guns away. And why, why is it not working in Chicago? The reason it's not working in Chicago is what we call the Iron Pipeline. Chicago does have, and New York for that matter, have very strict gun laws. But um, criminals purchase guns in, in states with loose laws, Carolinas, Virginia, wherever, and they bring it up. We don't have, we don't have a, um, a customs stations at state borders, so they bring it up to New York or Chicago or wherever. And that's why the local gun laws are ineffective as long as you don't have a national gun law. So do, do, do criminals care about laws, gun laws? No, the criminals certainly don't, but if you had a national law, you can enforce it. You can't enforce local laws because criminals can buy it where it's legal and ship it into New York or Chicago or wherever. I just find this interesting. Uh, that's always, you know, your answer is taking the guns away. Red flag laws, which as you're seeing in New York City, uh, to divert the attention away from the police from actually trying to find the criminals and trying to, to take them off the streets, 
uh, to, to do the red flag laws is, is totally insane. I point opinion. out that New York City has a much lower crime rate than, for instance, Bakersfield, California, or most other areas in the country. Is that because of gun laws? Or? Uh, no, I don't think it's because of gun laws. I'm just pointing it out because people often, uh, I've heard many Republicans talk about the carnage in New York. It's not true. Well, your other comment about public health emergency. What? You made a comment about the public health emergency um, during COVID didn't take away the rights of the individual. <clears throat> was that, I'm asking, was that your comment? Yes. I'm saying so it did not take public, the rights. That the public health measures um, to prevent the spread of a, of a, of a pandemic, um, forcing people to wear masks, or requiring people to wear masks, is just common sense and saved, I'm sure, millions of lives. So that was intent to, to prevent the spread of the of COVID? Course, of course. What about the illegals that you had, that you let across the border, that you never tested, because there is no point of entry? What about them? Well, you shouldn't be letting illegals cross the border. And the question, the problem is, nobody, not Biden, not Trump, has figured out how to keep them out of the country. Have they increased since Biden has been in office? They. It, it went down for, for, for a year under Trump and then went right back up, starting under Trump and kept going under Biden. That's, that's amazing you're, you're making that statement. Everybody, I mean, I mean the, your own city, New York, is, uh, is being overrun. Eric Adams is now asking for yes. federal dollars. Yes, and, and New York, that's quite correct. Declaring a sanctuary city to welcome them in now is wanting federal money, or money we don't have. That's insane. Well, we have... You're talking about, a t well, I'm not going to get into the figures. We could afford it. The country can, the city can. Oh, the country can afford it. Yes. Is 32 trillion in debt a myth? What? Is 32 trillion in debt a myth? No, 32 trillion in debt is not a myth, but if we hadn't passed the Trump tax cuts and we taxed the super wealthy the way we should, tax the super cut, wealthy. You, would cut, you would cut the deficit greatly. And the economy must have been, is better now under this Biden administration than it was under President Trump. Yes, the, the unemployment rate has come down to 3. Point, uh, what is it, 3.6%. Okay. Well, we're going to have to agree to disagree. Uh, Ms. Tiffany, I appreciate you following up with this, putting this up. This is, if we don't speak up against the objections of what the liberals are doing all across this country in every office, uh, this is the right thing to do, and I appreciate, it. appreciate you bringing it up, and uh, we'll continue to bring it up. We're not going to let them violate our Second Amendment rights. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Roy, is recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. I thank the chairman. Um, Mr. Tiffany, uh, am I correct with respect to what we're discussing right now, which was a resolution um, regarding the governor of New Mexico's unconstitutional um, deprivation of individuals Second Amendment rights with respect to an emergency order. Am I correct that the New Mexico Attorney General, Raul Torres, a Democrat, stated he will not defend the emergency order? Do you, do you, have you, have you, uh, are you familiar with that? My, I think I have uh, indication that from my, quote, from my perspective is an inappropriate application of the Public Health Emergency Act to use that the power, which is pretty extraordinary but also very narrowly limited public health emergencies to extend that to try and cover an outright ban on the carrying of weapons uh, is, in my judgment, unconstitutional. Does that sound right that the Attorney General of New Mexico took that position? That is correct. He went on to say only responsible gun owners are likely to abide by the ban. Um, is it also correct that um, uh, the Bernalillo County Sheriff John Allen, also a Democrat, announced that his department would not enforce the governor's 30-day ban, arguing that it violates the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. Is that correct? That is correct, and he went on to say this ban does nothing to curb gun violence. Uh, is it also correct that United States Senator Martin Heinrich, Democrat from New Mexico, issued a statement that said gun violence is a problem, but said that governor's executive order is an unworkable solution that won't save lives? You know, I haven't seen his quote, but um, um, if he believes in the Constitution, I could see him saying that. Is it also correct that um, uh, the uh, 
relatively left-leaning gun rights activist David Hogg said, quote, I support gun safety, but there's no such thing as a state public health emergency exception to the U.S. Constitution. That is quote. correct. Um, do you share <coughs> the concern by these individuals, regardless of their uh, political spectrum, uh, wherever they fall, that the United States Constitution um, is uh, deserving of support and that it would be important for the United States House of Representatives to speak out in defense of the constitutional rights being violated by a governor of one of the 50 states of the union? Yes, and I'm glad some Democrats around the country are expressing their disagreement with the governor's uh, executive order. Um, on a separate point, and I don't have a lot more to add beyond that which my friend from Kentucky articulated very uh, well, um, but, but at the core of the um, issue, and there was some back and forth on this about guns and taking guns and so forth, um, if you are, for example, hypothetically speaking, a resident of the state of Texas whose house is maybe 120, 150 miles from the border, and if you are, hypothetically speaking, dealing with constant um, uh, cars that are running through ranches and taking down fences and gotaways and, and you're having people's homes getting broken into and you're having uh, crime that you're having to deal with, when you're dealing with district attorneys in cities like San Antonio and Austin and cities throughout the country where district attorneys are no longer enforcing laws, like, for example, the gentleman who, I use the word gentleman inappropriately here, the man who uh, committed crimes, burglaries, uh, and uh, was let out by a judge uh, with effectively no bail, and then came out and killed, or I'm sorry, shot and wounded a uh, San Antonio police officer just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, myriad cases like this, uh, increased crime rates, um, even with some declines in the last year or two from the spikes during COVID, still uh, significantly higher than 2019 pre-COVID that to the extent that you've got significant uh, cartel operations in South Texas and a continued influx of individuals that we don't even know who they are because of the known gotaways because of an open border and continuing to endanger the United States. The individual in Pennsylvania who uh, escaped from prison after stabbing his girlfriend 28 times in this country coming here illegally. The young man who was killed on a bus because someone got away and was driving and ran into a school bus on the first day of school and this 11-year-old boy died in, in Ohio. Um, the young man who was a supposed unaccompanied alien child was taken in by a father and the father was stabbed and killed in Florida. I could go on with the crime uh, issues that we're dealing with. Uh, when, when you are removing the ability of law enforcement, for example, in Austin, Texas, or for example, in other states, I'm sure you've had similar situations in Wisconsin, uh, where uh, $150 million is cut from a police department's budget and the police are no longer able to respond to 911 on a timely basis because of radical leftists running cities, in what universe is it appropriate for the government in any way, shape, or form, much less by an executive action by a governor unconstitutionally using emergency powers to undermine the ability of an American citizen to defend him or herself? Um, I believe it may be inadvertent on our friends across from the aisle but they are the number one gun salesman in the United States of America. And this has been going on now for a couple decades. People will arm themselves. And when you look at the number of women who have chosen to get concealed carry permits and to buy guns, it is skyrocketing. And it's because they do not feel safe. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd like to, if I may, just uh, close with a couple, uh, three comments. Um, your colleague on this dais, said we were attacking New Mexico. No, that's not it at all. We're rebuking the governor for trying to deny people their Second Amendment rights. This isn't against the people of the state of New Mexico. Number two, we've heard a lot about gun violence today. And the gentleman from Texas just alluded to some of this. We have prosecutors in cities that do not prosecute crime anymore. And I'm going to give you a quick example. In Milwaukee County, in my state, here was his quote from about 15 years ago. Is it possible someone will be killed as a result of a parole or diversion that comes through my office? Absolutely. But that does not change the fact that we should be doing what we're doing to change um, how 
we go about prosecuting crime. He's accepting of it. We have prosecutors that don't prosecute crime. You wonder why people commit more crime? We had the defund the police movement. I mean, is it any surprise that that's happened? And look at what's been on, the, on all the television stations that I've seen, the cable networks over the last 24 hours, is the officer that was assassinated in Los Angeles. It is open season on law enforcement in America since the riots of 2020. I live in one of the most rural districts that you'll find in the United States. Largest community, 50,000 people. We have had three officers in 2023 that have been gunned down. The last one was in just across the border from the Twin Cities, and that person that came out, came out and gunned down that sheriff's deputy was out as a result of a violent crime that they only served four years for. We wonder why there's violence that continues to escalate in America. And the final thing that I will say, make no doubt about it, this may be one governor in the United States of America, but there's a whole lot of elected officials around America, in particular on the other side of the aisle, that are quietly applauding this. And that's why this resolution is so important. We need to send the message that we will stand up for the Second Amendment to the Constitution. Because if they could take the guns, they will. And all you have to do is look at Australia and countries like that where the exact thing has happened. That is why this resolution is important. We need to stand up for our constitutional rights every day of the year. And I thank the gentleman from Wisconsin, and, and I'll, I'll uh, wrap up, but I uh, appreciate his sentiments. I would only just underscore your point about other leaders in this country, executive branch or legislative, who would be all too happy to go down the road that we just saw the governor of New Mexico take. And I would note that you are absolutely correct. I would say it probably tends, tends to be my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, but no, I want, we need to look in the mirror. There are a lot of Republicans who are all too happy to use the power of government when it affects them and when they're able to uh, use that power, uh, for example, the uh, former president of the United States issuing an award to uh, an individual that uh, advocated for shutting down the largest economy in the history of the world. I yield back. Thank you very much. Any further questions to the panel? I just, I just want to say for the record, I can't believe we've spent all this time talking about a non-binding resolution. Uh, I, re I, I mean, really. With all that's going on with regard to gun violence, with all that's going on with regard to our government about to be shut down, this is how we just spent all this time. I hope you're all proud of yourselves. I, I yield back. I'm very proud of the panel, and I'm very proud of myself, and I'm very proud of the bill, and I thank the gentleman for bringing it. Thank you very much. I think I yield. Um, with that, I'd like to thank the panel again for their testimony, and uh, gentlemen are excused. I'd like to welcome our third panel, Representative David Joyce and Stephanie Weiss, and Ranking Member Rosa DeLore from the Committee on Appropriations. I think they're in the next room, at least or outside. Please come up to the table. You too. We're equal opportunity, yeah. This one might be close too. <laughs> I think Representative Vice is in the next room.
I want to uh, welcome our third panel, Representative uh, David Joyce and Stephanie Weiss and Ranking Member Rosa DeLore from the Committee on Appropriations. Representative Joyce, uh, welcome back to the Rules Committee, and I'd welcome your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern, and the members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on the Continuing Appropriations and Border Security Enhancement Act of 2024. One of the most important powers of the Constitution gives Congress is to provide funding for government operations. Unless we act, in 12 short days, the government will shut down, with the exception of certain activities that sustain the lives and the safety of the American people. This bill keeps the government open for an additional 31 days, so the Appropriations Committee in both the House and Senate can continue to bring individual, bill, bu 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 individual bills to the floor before final negotiations to resolve the differences and enact a fiscal year 2024 appropriations bill. As a nation, we are $32.9 trillion in debt, and our deficit this year is $1.9 trillion. Congress continues to spend more money that we do not have, so we borrow more and more. This course is not sustainable. This bill will come due, and it will not be pleasant. To restrain spending growth, this measure includes an 8% across the board reduction to align the Fiscal Responsibility Act spending cap. However, that reduction does not apply to defense, veterans, and disaster relief. In addition, this bill forces this administration, the Biden administration, to do what it will not do on its own, act to address the border security crisis that has been raging for the last two and a half years. This bill includes the bulk of H.R. 2, the House passed Border Security and Immigration Enforcement Bill, and several provisions from my Homeland Security Appropriations Bill that <clears throat> together will put us on a path to securing the border. We have seen more than 2 million, Im 2 million migrants come across the border illegally each of the last two years, and this year's numbers are on the same trajectory. <clears throat> no one can say with a straight face that we have operational control on the border. For the last month, the encounters have only accelerated with over 9,000 on average every day. And tens of thousands are passing through Panama on their way north as we speak, so this is only going to get worse before it gets better. It is clear this administration is focused on managing the border and not securing it. Whatever steps the administration claims it is taking, they're not working. The reason is simple. Policy matters. And the administration is sending all the wrong signals to the cartels and migrants with its open border policies. When you fail to enforce the nation's immigration laws, more will come. When you abuse parole to let in hundreds of thousands en masse, more will come. When you allow the asylum system to be gamed, more will come. And the reality is that overwhelming majority of the migrants who enter the country through these false pathways have no legal basis to remain in our country. We should stop offering that false hope to so many. This bill provides a solution to keep the government open, secure the border, restrain the growth of government spending while we negotiate the final fiscal year 2024 appropriations bills. Thank you for holding this hearing. I'm ready to answer your questions, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. We'll go next to my very good friend from Oklahoma. It's wonderful to have you here. I think I note for the record, probably the first time you're testifying on behalf of the Appropriations Committee. So, gentlelady from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you are correct. It is my first time to be here with you before this committee. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, my colleague and friend Dave Joyce for being here this evening. And first and foremost, I want to reiterate that the package before you is focused on securing the southern border. For far too long, this administration's open border policies have decimated communities as fentanyl and crime have flowed across the U.S.-Mexico border. I am pleased that this bill includes nearly the entirety of H.R. 2 plus nine appropriations limitation provisions to block the Mayorkas DHS from releasing aliens into the interior while they await a hearing, issuing employment authorization documents to certain aliens, and halting the use of the CBP-1 app. Of course, the legislation also seeks to avert a government shutdown in a fiscally responsible way. The bill is at a funding level that is about 1% lower than the current spend rate and holds funding for DOD and veterans programs harmless. In doing so, the bill does impose an 8% across the board cut on the remainder of the non-defense, non-veterans, and non-disasters discretionary funding for the duration of the one-month continuing resolution. This will provide additional time for us to complete our work on the remaining appropriations bills. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. 
Thank you very much. It's also a great pleasure to recognize uh, and welcome back my very good friend, the distinguished ranking member of the Appropriations Committee. I note for the record that while you were pouring your water, you first poured water for Mr. Joyce. Right. I was going to provide some for uh, Congresswoman Bice, but well, I couldn't well, get her attention. This tells you the kind of person my friend <laughs> is. So <laughs> as she goes into battle, she still makes sure that you're going to be taken care of on the other side. <laughs> that I recognize my very good friend, the Ranking Member Appropriations Committee, for any remarks she cares to make. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and thank uh, Ranking Member McGovern. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I oppose consideration of this continuing resolution, uh, which perpetrates the majority's inability and unwillingness to govern responsibly. The clock has run out. We are less than two weeks away from a government shutdown and have little to show for it. Yet rather than negotiate in good faith on the bipartisan legislation that everyone knows will ultimately be required to keep the United States government operational, House Republicans are attempting to unify their own conference with a disastrous continuing resolution that would cut border security and the Coast Guard, cut biomedical research at the National Institutes of Health, obliterate LIHEAP, abandon distressed farmers and rural communities, cripple the FAA, and that's our air traffic controller, desert our allies, yield global competitiveness and energy leadership to China, cut funding to fight wildfires, pull thousands of teachers out of our children's classrooms hardly a month into the school year, and cut needed funds for a 988 crisis lifeline. Finally, we get to see an America first bill. But how does this bill put the American people first? This bill cuts America first. Then it cuts Israel. It cuts Ukraine and other allies. It cuts funding for the border. It cuts police, teachers, doctors, and scientists. It cuts children and families. And it cuts farmers. I understand that there was some confusion on the conference call that House Republicans held last night over what, if anything, was cut from the border. I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are concerned with the border. But allow me to let you know what is in your bill. It is an 8.1% cut for border security measures. Please let your leadership know if you have any questions. And if they still cannot answer them, I would be happy to. But I implore you to please read the bill. Read the bill. Winter is coming. It gets cold in Connecticut. And even colder, I am sure, in the Dakotas. Yet our colleagues from North and South Dakota have introduced a bill that cuts LIHEAP an astonishing 65% from last year's level. What will happen to those that depend on this program for assistance paying their energy bills. This is unprecedented because this body has never not provided LIHEAP the resources needed in a continuing resolution or otherwise. It has always been a bipartisan priority. Or consider the constituents of our colleagues from Florida. We are still in the heart of hurricane season and have already seen a storm devastate coastal communities this year. Not only would this bill directly inflict cuts to FEMA and the National Weather Service, harming our readiness in the face of escalating catastrophes, it undermines our response capabilities as well. How will Americans dealing with impacts from natural disasters react when they learn how emergency disaster relief funding fares in this bill, when cleanup and recovery efforts in their neighborhood are shut off because the funding ran dry. My good friend, the chairman from Oklahoma, is a champion for Native American programs. Yet activities for Native American children, families, and law enforcement would all be cut. Roads, energy, development, public safety, and education on tribal lands would be upended. And you know, Mr. Chairman, I believe you know, as I do, the hard work and the sincere compromise and collaboration that is required 
to actually pass appropriations bill. This bill will not become law. Everyone in this body knows that to be true. The bill's time frame does not give enough time to consider all 12 appropriations bills. This would not be the only continuing resolution required to get us to the finish line. This is not a 30-day agreement. It will be continu a continuing resolution after continuing resolution with the same cuts and the same disastrous consequences. It is long past time to abandon this partisan path and for appropriators to work together to get the job done. Appropriators know how to do this. And in fact, we already have a path signed into law by the president, endorsed by the speaker, and passed by this body to get there. And from the day the majority reneged on that agreement, we have known that we are headed for a continuing resolution at best and a shutdown at worst. Democrats are ready to work. We were ready in the spring. We were ready last week. We are ready today, tomorrow, and every day to work in good faith with our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to do the work of the American people. And I hope the members of the majority will find it within themselves to step forward and to do the same. I thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Thank you for your testimony. Again, I want to welcome all three of my colleagues here, all of whom I hold in exceptionally uh, high regard. And uh, I agree with you all that uh, we certainly need to make sure the government does shut down, or does not shut down. And uh, I think we have time to get that task done. I consider this a worthy effort in that and uh, a good place to start. Uh, with that, I have no questions for the panel, so I'll go to my Good friend, Dr. Burgess, the vice chair of the committee, for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm still in the process of doing my own evaluation of what's in front of us, but let me just ask, <clears throat> and the president has <clears throat> shocked and worried many of us many times over the last two and a half years. One of the more shocking things that he said recently was in response to the in high number of undocumented immigrants that were showing up in New York and Boston and to uh, placate the mayors of, and governors of, of, of those political entities, he said he might institute a remain in Texas policy. <laughs> oh my God, how absolutely frightening. And clearly it's in response to, yes, our governor has been helping people actually doing what the federal government was doing and putting people on planes and buses and getting them to the destination where they wanted to go. <clears throat> the governor of, I mean, I'm sorry, the mayor of, of New York City complained that, uh, I don't remember, he said he had uh, 6,000 people. Oh, my gosh. In Texas, we call that Tuesday morning. In the two and a half years of this administration, well over 2 million people have entered the country illegally. Most of those have arrived in Texas, some in New Mexico, some in Arizona, fewer in California. But where they go from there is anyone's guess. Now, I tried to get the Secretary of Health and Human Services, when he came before our budget committee, with his views and estimates on the budget, I asked him what he was prepared to do to help smaller communities smaller municipalities, smaller school districts, smaller health care facilities in the state of Texas, what is he doing, what is he proposing to do to help them with what they will soon be facing? And he basically had no answer for that. He said there are intergovernmental arrangements that will take place. Well, I'm waiting, and I haven't seen them happen yet. And now that we have mayors and governors in other cities complaining about what Texas has been enduring year, month in and month out, literally every month of this administration, now it becomes a problem. So I'm, I'm concerned when I hear that there may be a prohibition on moving people out of one place to another. Is there something you can help me with to help me better understand that we will not be just requiring Texas to 
maintain control of those individuals just indefinitely. Thank you for the question. And yes, I think we recognize that um, this is a, sort of a difficult conversation. The reality is that the administration should be actually instituting the Remain in Mexico plan. Um, we are trying to, I think, look at how do we keep uh, control of these individuals that are crossing into the, into the United States illegally uh, and, you know, busing them or transporting them across the country actually causes some significant issues. And let me, um, let me offer this up. According to the New York Times, the administration has lost over 85,000 children that they, under law, have a responsibility to care for. Now, whether that's they have transported them to some other state, we don't know. These are the questions that I think uh, everyone is asking. Um, the influx has certainly put dire straits on all of our social services, including uh, in cities like New York, Arizona, and most certainly Texas. Um, and the, this crisis is costing our states $12 billion in New York this year alone. Um, the ICE office is fully booked through October of 32. You know, we have to try to find a way to stop this influx. And this is certainly one very small minor way to sort of put a um, stop gap in place. And I wanna, uh, you know, maybe just circle back around to a comment that, um, that Ms. Delora made initially about FEMA. FEMA funding is actually taken care of in here. You know, if you look at the language that was put forward, we are allowing flexibility for FEMA to be able to spend up to their entire year's appropriation so that there is no question uh, of taking care of services in these affected communities that currently have um, natural disasters. So with that, I yield. Well, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Joyce, Chairman Joyce, when you, uh, you made the comment in, in your remarks, when you fail to enforce, more will come. And actually, I th think very much that is true, but the opposite is also true. When you do enforce, you will reduce that pressure mm -hmm. that is now existing on our on our southern border, and we know this because it's it's worked before. When the unprecedented influx of Honduran immigrants occurred in 2014, ironically, two years after President Obama unilaterally instituted DACA which sent the message down south that if you get here, you're going to be able to get in free. We'll give you a permiso, and you'll be able to stay in the country indefinitely. What changed that equation was they began to send Hondurans back <laughs> and Guatemalans back and Salvadorans back. And when they did that, the numbers plummeted. Now... They didn't keep it up, unfortunately. Um, and I do recall there was some concern. You have a plane load of children who've arrived here without permission and you send them back. It's, it does raise some questions of what's going to happen to them. And that's in 2014. That's President Obama. Mm -hmm. When President Trump put the Remain in Mexico policy, when it actually was up and running and working, it really did dramatically reduce the numbers. So we know what works. Now, unfortunately, this administration, and I, I mean, I don't know why they do some of the things they've done. It's almost like they deliberately are, are determined to hurt the country. But look, I was down at, uh, El, in, at Fort Bliss in El Paso mm -hmm. talking to Customs Border Patrol there, and they talked about the Remain in Mexico policy and how it had helped. But then shortly after the Biden administration came on board and they said they weren't going to do it anymore, but then the courts told them they still had to, still the numbers were minuscule compared to what they had been 15, 18 months previously. That is when the Trump administration had instituted that policy. So in other words, there was no, they really had no interest in enforcing what the courts told them they had to continue doing until Congress changed the law. So I... Forgive me for being so discouraged about what the administration has done. I, I hope and pray that you will be able to get the attention of the administration and make them understand that this is their problem and they have to fix it. Um, the Vice President of the United States, perhaps in response to some of the criticisms that had come from here, said, 
loudly and clearly, I'm talking to you in Central America, don't come. But then every action they take opens the door wider and they encourage more people to come. And then what do we see the, from this weekend? Uh, Bill Malusian, a Fox News reporter, uh, with the film clips of that train, open uh, train coming in from somewhere in central Mexico, bringing people in. That's the sort of thing that gets translated back downstream. The cartels take advantage of that. And it's so damaging to the people who then who are who who are or take that risk to come here. I understand why they do it, but coming through the Darien Gap, oh my God. It is it is a human it, it's a human tragedy what is going on there, and this administration continues to fan the flames of it and to tell people to continue to come here, and we're not going to do a damn thing. So I hope you're successful with this. I do have some concerns about some of it, but uh, um, we'll get you a rule, we'll get it on the floor, and we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Dr. Burgess, yeah. uh, I appreciate wholeheartedly what you're saying, and that's why I've been fighting to make sure that our full homeland appropriation bill makes it here someday soon and we can get those things in there because uh, there's no way you, you can say what this administration is doing is uh, Christian, charitable, or in the best interest of those people they're encouraging to come here. Uh, we need to stand, uh, what you talk about in 14, I remember with the meeting with the presidents of those countries at that time who said, we don't want to lose these people. These are our good citizens. We want to keep those people at home. You know, would the president uh, uh, you know, tell them not to come? Then President Obama, to his credit, started sending people back home there, which helped stem the flow and earned him the title of uh, deporter-in-chief at times. And, and certainly the next administration did the same thing, put up the red light that it's going to happen. So with all the policies and procedures that we're going to put in place uh, going in with our funding bill, it still won't stem the tide unless this administration works to do those things. And why we're trying to do those things, you know, it costs, we want to detain more people, we have to have more beds. We will fund more beds. We want to make sure that those people who are here awaiting their disposition of their case are on a means of alternative to detention. In other words, whether it's a phone or ankle brace or something, where they're communicated with and make sure that we know exactly where they're at. The transportation policy that we have in here will not allow people to be airdropped, if you will, into these communities without at least giving notice to these communities in the first place that they're sending these folks there. Because it's wrong what we're doing. It's not compassionate, it's not Christian, and we need to change the way we're doing this. And the only way we can do this is when we pass the whole Homeland Security Bill, uh, Appropriations Bill. But I understand there's some pieces and parts here that, that that'll go in this one, because this is just buying us the 30 days so we can get on with the discussion to try to cure the problems that you uh, rightfully have brought up here. And I feel for you, for all Texans, uh, for the problems that have existed. Thanks, Chairman. I'll yield back. To you, gentlemen from uh, Massachusetts, English ranking members, recognize why their questions seek Well, thank you, Mr. Post. Chairman. And I, I want to agree with one thing Dr. Burgess said at the beginning uh, of his remarks, and that is he's trying to still figure out what is in all of this uh, this bill that has been brought before us, uh, which, I mean, we literally just received. It's liter the, the, the paper is still hot. It's hot off the press. Um, uh, Speaker McCarthy was just asked, you know, uh, you know, uh, why have why are members on the Republican side so, um, you know, concerned or, or re reservations about this? And he said, and he was asked, have they read it? And he goes on to say, sometimes they haven't read all the way through. Uh, let's let them understand what it is and see where they are. So the bottom line is, I don't think anybody. I mean, there 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 are major cuts in across the board here, and I don't think anybody truly understands the impact. Uh, of what these cuts will mean. But I do want to, uh, on, on Meet the Press Daily, uh, our colleague, uh, Congressman Womack from Arkansas, was, was just on, and he was asked, uh, the, the host asked, Congressman, we just went uh, over some of the things in this deal that were put together to attract conservative support, the border elements of it, but it does look like it may be DOA less than 24 hours after it was announced. 
Some of your colleagues, Matt Gage, no, Matt Ro uh, Rosendale, called it a continuation of Nancy Pelosi's budget and Joe Biden's policy. Marjorie Taylor Greene says it's a no. Uh, what do you make of this mess right now? And Congressman Womack's response was, well, it's an unmitigated disaster right now on the majority side. Look, I'm fearful of what this leads to. And he went on to say that he didn't even think the majority has the votes to pass this rule. Uh, do you agree with uh, our colleague, Mr. Womack, that this is an unmitigated disaster? Uh, certainly, uh, Congressman Womack is entitled to his opinion. There's 434 other opinions or 432 other opinions, I'm sure, in this building as to what this bill is. But what I see this is a, a way to get to where we need to go, and that is to pass all 12 appropriation yeah, bills well, that's not what we're in doing the next here. 30 days. I mean, yeah. And, and I guess I, I disagree with, I, I'd only add I, with one thing, uh, the way Congressman Womack characterized it. I, I don't think it's just an unmitigated disaster on the Republican side. I think it's an under mitigated disaster for our country uh, if we were to shut the government down. I, May yeah, I? Yeah. I think what's an unmitigated disaster is what's happening at our southern border. Yeah. Well, uh, and we're yeah, continuing yeah, yeah, to, to yeah. Uh, ignore the real issue, which is why we're yeah. trying to put well, you, some policies you, in place And your response is you it, cut so. border security money, which I can't quite get my head around. But in any event, uh, Mr. Joyce, did you write this bill? Is this your, I, I mean, I want to, I just, because I'm just, there is, I'm looking at some of the things in this bill. Uh, have you put this bill together the? No, sir. All right. Because, I mean, you know, I, I, I hear my call, I hear my colleagues say that we have to be fiscally responsible. You know, that, uh, you know, that's why these 8% across the board cuts are justified. But here's what I don't get. When you cut, like, things like medical research on cancer, on Alzheimer's, and on heart disease, I mean, yeah, I guess in, in, in the short term you can claim a, a, a you know, a, a savings, I suppose, because you're cutting something. But what you're doing is you're slowing progress on, on research that will find a cure. If we could find a cure to Alzheimer's disease, wouldn't we all agree? that not only would it be this tremendous benefit for the whole world, all of humankind, but we would save countless dollars in healthcare costs right now that we need to expend to be able to pay for people with Alzheimer's. Um, or, you know, if we could find more cures and more treatments for cancer to keep people out of hospitals, why would, why is that a, why isn't, why, why don't we look at that as an investment that brings us savings? Or Head Start. I mean, Head Start, you know, 8%, Head Start gets cut. I mean, the whole point of Head Start is to, you know, to give young kids an opportunity to succeed. I mean, I, you know, uh, without programs like that, uh, I mean, lots of kids would fall through the cracks. And yeah, that's a tragedy for those individuals, but if all you care about is, you know, the bottom line, um, you're going to end up paying more in other programs to be able to deal with that. I mean, I, I, I don't get it. I mean, cuts in law enforcement, FBI, DEA, other federal law enforcement officers, fighting terrorism, fentanyl trafficking, uh, border security funding, as uh, Ranking Member DeLauro has pointed out, is cut. FAA, including air traffic controllers, Army Corps of Engineers construction activities, WIC, WIC gets cut. I thought that was, uh, I thought we had a bipartisan consensus that, that WIC, you know, is a good thing that helps a lot of, you know, pregnant mothers deliver healthy babies and, you know, young children be able to get a, get a start. LIHEAP cut by 65%. Mr. Laura, am I right? LIHEAP yes. gets cut by 65%? Yes. 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 Does did anybody disagree that, that these are cuts in these programs or, or? May I? Yeah, you may, yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about 31 days at an 8% cut, which annually is 1%. If you look at the numbers, they compare to the 2019 funding levels, which I would add was the budget you're, that- You're playing games with numbers. No, and I'm not, I'm that, actually and, trying and, 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 and to so, explain. So wait, so wait a minute, so what you're saying here is that, that you would only favor a cut for one month in these programs, and then you would not support it. What I'm saying is this particular a, bill is looking no, at a, no, a, a one please, month, 31 day continuing resolution, please. so we can negotiate some of yeah, these please, issues. Well, but, but let me just remind everyone that yeah. we talk over each other. Oh, there are stronger. I mean, this is this is up. this is so mad. Gentlemen, gentlemen will suspend. We do have to be careful not to talk over each other. Otherwise, a correct record of this uh, proceeding will not will not occur. 
The gentleman from Massachusetts controls the time. I mean, these cuts are intentional. And, and, I, and I don't know about, maybe I don't know what, I mean, I've, I've listened to all kinds of news stations, and I'm hearing the, uh, the comments from uh, your Republican colleagues who are reluctant to support some of these appropriations bills because, quite frankly, they don't have trust, you know, that, that you will follow through. So are you telling, and now I guess I, I get it. I don't, I don't understand. Are we, are we, are we just doing a, a cut for symbolism or, you know, to, to, to make a point to try to get people to get on for, uh, to vote for a bill for a month? And then what happens a month later? Do, do people no longer want the cuts? I mean, I, I, I don't even, you know, I mean, cuts in wildfire suppression, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, rural housing service and rural utility services. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, the gentleman from Texas was going on about the high cost of energy, and yet LIHEAP, um, if these numbers were to hold, would be cut by 65%. Every single person on this panel, no matter what state you come from, uh, have hundreds of thousands of, con of constituents in your state that benefit from LIHEAP. You know, you start cutting that program, um, you know, there are going to be people who will not be able to heat their homes or cool their homes in, in some cases. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I, and, and again, I, I guess I, I agree with Dr. Burgess. We're still trying to understand all of this and to do an analysis of what these cuts would mean if they were to stay in, in place. But we, ju we, just, we, just, we just received them, Ms. DeLauro. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I thank you. Let me just correct the record in, 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 in several items here. First of all, with regard to FEMA, uh, it's the, uh, uh, the, the, the $20 billion uh, that is there. The $16 billion that comes out of the supplemental is not there, which is what has been anticipated in an effort to deal with what happened in Maui and other more recent tragedy, so we're not going to have enough money for FEMA. Let's take a look at border security for a moment, and I want to talk about LIHEAP. Border security that everybody, as I said, is so very much concerned about. This is an 8.1% cut to border security. That is billions of dollars to be cut. You can't you can't talk out of both sides of your mouth and be concerned about border security and then deal with an 8.1% cut. And Congressman Joyce, who is a dear friend, we serve on the committee together, as does uh, uh, Ms. Bice, that border policy is not Christian. Over 11,000 Christians have signed a petition decrying the immorality of the House Republican cuts. And the cuts are repeated in the bill before us here today. Let me talk about uh, the LIHE program, which, as I said, in the past, for those who have been here for a number of years um, and understand, that LIHE has always been a bipartisan effort because it's cold in New England, it's cold in the Midwest, it's cold and it's, it's hot in some places. So LIHE, it's understandable that people want to make sure that folks have the opportunity uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to survive. So this bill funds LIHEAP at an annual level of only $1.4 billion. Problem. It was a $4 billion program last year. We passed a bill last year for $4 billion. LIHEAP allocates 90% of its funding at the beginning of the fiscal year, I might add. And October is a critical month for the LIHEAP program. Last year, LIHEAP set its allocations to each state and for the tribes on October 20th, as states need the funding of the beginning of the fiscal year to be able to prepare for the winter. By the way, the 90% allocation for last year totaled $3.4 billion. And even if LIHEAP could allocate 100% of the amounts provided in this bill, that would only be $1.5 four billion dollars. It's a 65 percent cut. It's not 8.1 percent cut because you've disregarded what happened in the bill and in the budget that we are currently in this year 
which has provided that money. You just eliminate $2.5 billion. You leave the balance, and then you cut it by 8.1%. Think about it. As, as, as uh, uh, Congressman McGovern said, read it closely. It is, uh, 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 this, it is disastrous. And I don't believe anybody wants to see disastrous. But that's what this is, 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 is all about. And the, we could, th this notion, I just have to, that this is a one, either a 1% cut or 31 days. That, uh, uh, Congressman McGovern pointed this out. What happens at the end of 30 days? We are not going to have a, 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 a 12 individual appropriations bills at the end of 30 days. It takes a good six weeks to put these bills together. So that means that we are going to continue these cuts into a next 30 day of a, a, a continuing resolution and on and on and on until we can get to a point where we are sitting and talking about what we did last December when we came together Democrats and Republicans, uh, to put together a bill that crossed the finish line on being able to fund the, fund, fund the government. And I would just say on that issue that House Republicans decided not to participate in that process a year ago in December, but Senator Shelby, Senator Leahy, and myself hammered out a bill. We compromised. Everybody did not get what they want, but we got the bill done, and it was a good bill. Again, one other point, a 1% cut is misleading. There is not a single program, not a single program that is cut by 1% under this bill. They are cut by so much more. And if you take a look at the bill, page 6, line 11, it reads, reduced by 8.1%. 285%. That is an 8% cut right. to every domestic program outside of the Department of Veteran Affairs. It is, it is really, it, it, it's almost ludicrous to think, and, and on the, the issue border. that you talk about is border security, that you cut border security by 8.1%. And, you know, let me just say, I, and I genuinely mean this, I think, Mr. Joyce, if you and Mr. Loro got in that room, you could work out a bill that would probably get 300 votes. I think it's fair to say that all appropriators uh, working right. in together. Yeah. Well, I'm just, but, but, but and, 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 and Ms. Spice, she said the magic word. She said, is to negotiate. To negotiate with who? I mean, we, Democrats haven't been asked to be part of any negotiation. Uh, Senate Democrats haven't been asked to be part of any negotiation. Senate Republicans haven't been asked to be part of any negotiation. You're, you, the, the right wing is negotiating with the far right wing, and guess what? It isn't working. Newsflash. This just came on, on you know, uh, Representative Good announces he is a no. Uh, so now I think the count is up to around 17 no's uh, and some undecideds uh, as of now uh, on, on this. And so, I mean, are we going to, you know, the, the Rules Committee is becoming a place now where we bring these things you know, we, we report out a rule, and we schedule a time to go to the floor, and then they pull it at the last minute. Uh, you know, and I, I don't know if that's going to happen here. But as of right now, and maybe because people haven't had time on your side to read all the stuff in the bill, but a lot of the Republicans that I know, I mean, they, they are strong supporters of medical research and Head Start, and they, 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 they believe in, you know, WIC and... They support LIHEAP because their constituents benefit from it. They support the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, I mean, that's not where they – we ought to, I mean, you want to make cuts, these, these arbitrary kind of across-the-board cuts, they're mindless. I mean, you, you do hearings on all these programs, and you decide where you think there can be savings and where there needs to be increases or where things can level off. You evaluate each thing line by line to go in and these – you know, what, everybody's going to take this cut, with the exception of, you know, the, the Pentagon and, and Veterans Affairs. I mean, I, it, it, it is so, I, I know, I, 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 we, we, I know 
my Republican friends, I know many of my Republican friends know we can do much, much better. Um, and I, I, I find the cuts in this to be offensive. I really do. I, and, and I find them to be counterproductive. And if they were to succeed, and if they were to be instituted you know, for the long term, which I would believe they would if this is the way we're operating uh, now, uh, constantly going to the right, to the right, to the right, um, you know, it would, it would mean a slowdown of progress in medical research, and it would mean more and more expenses uh, in our health care system. And we would not save money. We would be actually, uh, you know, we would actually be continuing to accumulate these huge, bill, huge bills. But I, I'll, I'll just close by, by, by saying we're getting to the point now. I mean, I, we were all home over the, over the uh, weekend. And, um, and I got to tell you, the, the, you guys aren't, you aren't running this place right. Um, and people know it. People see it. Um, and, you know, and, and, and by the way, not just Democrats, I mean, Republicans. Like, why can't we just, why can't, you just, why can't you get together and keep the government running? Why is keeping the government running such a huge deal. Why, why, people just don't get it. We can, we can negotiate things, by the way, in ways that I won't like everything in the bill and you won't like everything in the bill. But that's the way we've always done it. And at the end of the day, you can get a bill that passes overwhelmingly or we can continue this madness, which is taking us nowhere. I mean, this is going nowhere. We all know that. I'm not even sure we're going to get a vote on this. Uh, but in any event, I appreciate everybody being here. I mean, no disrespect to anybody, but I've had it. And I think a lot of our, my constituents have had it, the American people have had it. They just want us to get the job done. I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you very much. Um, that was an incredibly dramatic reading of all of the cuts that are 30 days. Mrs. Bice wanted to, was, was um, pointing that out. This is 30 days. Last week, we sat here, we listened to the ranking member talk about the shutdown, the shutdown, the shutdown. We've come forward with a CR, which I think is reasonable. We will then have our 30 days to work on our appropriations bills, look at the programs that you're talking about, do our job, work on that. The Democrats use CRs all the time. I remember uh, first, when I was first here, we were passing CRs. So this is not... Um, Will the gentleman yield? I'm not objecting. I will share. The, I'm not objecting. I will I'm not objecting to the use of a CR, um, and I, maybe the gentleman could just give us some certainty here that in fact this bill will come to the floor and pass. I mean, her ranking member. Uh, you, you know what? I we are we are working right now on what is happening right now in rules, and we will do our job here, and then we will see what happens with the floor. But and I did want to point out, I have read the bill. I've read the bill several times. I've made notes. I, 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 and obviously, you have read it because you have other, um, other things that you're talking about. And so to say that you just got it, I think is, it, well, uh, you, the, the ranking member has had the opportunity to read it because she's been talking about what's in the bill. Well, but I received, we, we, we so. received the bill, uh, the staff received the bill, it was posted uh, yesterday. And that's it, and so forth. And we worked very, very hard to read through it in order to be cogent and factual about okay. what is in the bill. Well, then we should remember that this is 30-day CR. Well, 30-day CR. And um, all of the drama surrounding the cuts, I mean, you read, both of you read many of them that obviously are of concern to people, but we need to remember what we're trying to do is get us to a point where we can work on those 12 appropriations bills, we can have those discussions, we can do that, and I appreciate the fact that there there is um, border security that HR uh, is it one or two two <laughs> HR two um, most of HR two is in here because you know what we're not talking about the people in my district dying of fentanyl overdoses and the fentanyl that's coming across the uh, across the border, you know um, we we didn't really hear about all of the issues that Texas was having until until New York threw up its hands and they're saying oh my gosh oh my gosh. But Texas has been facing that for, uh, for how long? You know, they've been dealing with the illegal immigrants coming across the border. So this is, um, this is a, I think, a reasonable solution to what we are dealing with. We, have our, we will have our 30 days. We'll be able to look at those appropriations bills. We're addressing the border. And, um, and all of the cuts that, that, that you're talking about, they're reductions, and they're 30 days. 30 days. And 
I did want to give Mrs. Bice the opportunity to kind of uh, complete your, your thoughts. You were talking about the 30 day and the 1% and I wanted you to complete that thought. Thank you. Um, I would just uh, maybe follow up with, it's a, it's a 31 day 31. Uh, I'm and, sorry, 31. and a one month. I stand corrected. A one month <laughs> CR um, with the idea that yes, we do wanna work on trying to put together those appropriations bills, many of which have already passed out of our committee and are um, you know, poised to, to make the floor um, to be passed through. I would also just say, we keep talking about the dr draconian cuts or we've heard about these cuts. Many of these uh, um, agencies, have, this is the same funding they had in 2019 or very similar to mm -hmm. it. These are not draconian cuts. And I, I think the American people have had enough in that we have seen or we'll see $2 trillion added to our national debt. The American taxpayers can't continue down this path. We have to be thoughtful and reasonable. Yes, uh, you know, funding for NIH and LIHEAP is something that we need to address. But I would also maybe counter that with, if our energy prices weren't so high because of the assault on, the, on this country's domestic energy production, we wouldn't see $5 a gallon gas. We wouldn't see high energy costs across the board, and maybe they wouldn't need to invest as much money in these light heat programs as they're currently doing. So thank you for the opportunity to respond. I, I recognize that this is certainly um, not perfect, but we are trying to move forward with three major points. One, securing the border, which this administration has failed to do. Two, protect our vets and our military by making sure that they are fully funded, and three, stopping uh, the uh, you know, unbelievable spend that we have seen over the last two and a half years under this administration. I yield. And, and I would agree with Mrs. Bice. We have to stop the out of control spending. We have to. And this will give us the opportunity to go into those, into those committees and take a look at where we can do that because we can't, we can't afford it. And the American people don't want us to continue the out of control spending in the, in the debt. But the gentleman yield, the gentleman yield. I would yes, I just will say that 31 days, mm -hmm. I, I, I've sat and, 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 and uh, Congressman Joyce has sat on the Appropriations Committee for a number of years. Please understand that to negotiate 12 bills, first of all, you've got to get to a place to negotiate. You're looking at at least six weeks in order to be able to put the bills together. I did this in December. Last December, as I said, with the help of Democrats and Republicans in the Senate. And we did a continuing resolution, and then it took us through to sometime in December in order for us to come to agreement. So this is not 30 days. This will be more than 30 days. And, and, and no one is going to tell me that you're going to then say, OK, so we are not going to cut border security by 8.1% for this next 30 days. But you cut border security right now. And it's an issue that you care deeply about. You can't walk away from that. And it is not, in fact, a 1% cut. There is no program that takes a 1% cut. The bill itself, in the language of the bill, page six, line, line 11, 11, I've got tells it right here, ma'am. That it is 8.1% in a cut. So that- For 30 days. The, but it's not. You're not gonna get, at the end of 30 days, you're not gonna have 12 bills. You know it, and I know it. Ma'am, but Mrs. Bice just said, that there are several that have already come out of the committee, so I'd like to yield to Mrs. Bice. Thank you. Um, in regards to the DHS uh, discussion, I think a reminder that the bill also includes appropriation limitation amendments for DHS that block Secretary Mayorkas from spending funding on wasteful and open border policies. The inclusion of HR2 in the package will ensure that the funds are being spent exactly where they need to be, on core border security operations, not on resettlement operations that actually lack legal status. Let's invest in border security, not these superfluous other areas that are, that are, that how, are currently being cope? funded by the administration. How do you cope with 8.1% cut to border security now? That's what you're doing. I, right just, this Mrs. Minute, Bice, 
I yield just laid place. it out here. No, you didn't. It yeah. includes appropriations limitations that block Mayorkas from spending funding on things that we consider to be open border policies and wasteful spending. You, you, it's difficult to argue that you wouldn't be able to find those savings for one month. And I recognize that you um, have been on appropriations much longer than I have, yeah. and you understand that this process is not a quick, quick one. But this is a starting point. This is a discussion point for us to move forward. And right now, we lack a secure border. Every state, if you poll you have no Americans right now, around this bill. if you poll I, Americans I, right now. You don't now, know that. Yes, you do. You have 17 see. Republicans who have said no. Well, well I, and, I, and I, Mr. Chair, I, I reclaim my time. I <laughs> but um, uh, we, you know what? It's not to the floor yet. We don't know. I'm sure that there are people having discussions. They're always having discussions. So whatever, if you believe everything you read in the press, then you can believe everything you read in the press. I mean, that's, oh, I guess Mr. Joyce, I yield to Mr. Joyce. Well, uh, just for the purpose of discussion here, 10 of the 12 uh, appropriation bills have made it through full committee. Oh, thank you. Uh, Waiting action on the floor. Who so. have not gotten to full so, committee at all, so, Labor, HHS, so, and Congress um, Justice So I Congress. guess, uh, you know, the, we, can, we can go through and you can, you can, create all the drama you want, saying we're cutting Head Start, we're doing all of this, we're doing all of that. But last week it was all about stopping a government shutdown. We've come forward with a bill. No, and I think Mrs. Bice said maybe not perfect, but we have come forward with this bill to make sure that we don't have government shutdown and, and we are able to do the work we need to do. But this has not so, been a negotiated bill. Okay, once again, not, I'm going to ask us not to talk over each other. I'm not talking over. I'm uh, just well, I, I'm, I'm, General, I have the floor. The gentlelady from Minnesota controls the time. And and I just I do think that um, we need to make sure that we are going forward. And um, Mrs. Bice and Mr. Joyce laid out a, a reasonable solution to what we need to do to keep going and to finish our work with the 12 appropriations bills. And as you pointed out, 10 of them are already out of committee. And so we will continue forward. But um, I don't think that it's fair uh, for, you know, for us to be having to listen to the issues regarding government shutdown when we're putting together a bill right now that would prevent that. So I will, um, I am, with that, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, I'll yield back because I believe we have votes. I would just yeah. say to the general lady that none of the bills except for one of the appropriations bills, has passed the floor of the House. I didn't say that. Agriculture did not make it. I didn't it. say that. Defense did not make did it. Not say that. So while they have not Neither passed have the it. floor. I would ask that you not talk over one another, please. No, I understand. So, uh, But uh, I expect a long and spirited debate. I just want to make it as easy on the stenographer as I possibly can. So. I would ask that. With that, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized for whatever question she cares to pose. And I would first yield a minute yeah. to Mr. McGovern. And I'll be very brief. I mean, can we have an honest conversation about what the reality is that we're dealing with here? I mean, yes. I mean, you have passed uh, appropriation bills out of the full committee. Most of them I don't like. Uh, <laughs> but you have passed them nonetheless. Your party is in charge. Um, and so far, only one of them has gone to the floor. We've tried with a couple of others, but they've had to be pulled. Not be because it's not Democrats' fault. It's because members of your own party don't think the cuts are deep enough. Um, and so the notion that somehow, don't worry, be happy, we're making these cuts, it's only one month, um, you know, ignores what we have been through these last several months. I mean, let's be honest, the speaker, you know, is, is essentially being blackmailed by a small group in this, in this chamber who are basically insisting on you know what is not only unreasonable, uh, but is unachievable because the majority of people in this house don't agree with these kinds of cuts, and not just here, but the Republicans in the Senate. Um, and you got to get bills that are that are signed by the president. So when you talk about negotiations, again, who are we negotiating with? You're negotiating with the extreme elements of your party that don't represent, I don't even think, a majority of Republicans in this country. Um, but, you know, they seem to have the power right now, um, and, and we are inching toward a shutdown. And if these numbers are true, that there are 17 members right now who are saying no on this, this is not buying us a month. We'll be back in Rules Committee at the end of this week uh, with something even more extreme. And, and if that doesn't work, then next week we'll be back with something even more extreme. So. At some point, you know, 
this madness has to stop, and we have to get serious about figuring out a way to get a majority votes, and, to, and, that, and you know, I would hope it would include Democrats, but if not, you gotta figure it out with, within your own party to get something done um, so that the Senate can react and then actually send us something over more reasonable, and we can pass that and then, and then move on. But I, again, I don't mean to take it out on, on you, um, and I appreciate you both being here, all three of you being here, but it's like, I mean, we're not even, we're not even being honest with ourselves here about what's going on, uh, never mind with the American people. And I, I just think this is a, if ever there's a moment for candor, it is now. And I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Um, I, I do hear the concerns. I think we all have concerns about our nation's fiscal health. But I think it is irresponsible to focus solely on cuts to domestic spending when our House Republican colleagues are unwilling to make wealthy corporations and billionaires pay their fair share, when we all know the biggest driver of our national debt in recent years has been the tax cuts that came through in 2017, and there are now movements to extend them into the future. Um, Representative DeLauro, you talked a little bit about the damage that even 31 days would do to FEMA funding, disaster relief funding. I find it kind of incredible that there's no disaster relief attached to this CR, and certainly um, the first responders in my area are very concerned about FEMA funding moving forward, but the concern I wanted to raise, we've seen report after report in recent days about rising childhood poverty and the impact of cuts to SNAP and WIC and Head Start. These are all things that have been proven over time to reduce costs to our country, giving kids mm -hmm a good start, and to hear that there would be even further cuts when every time I go home, I'm hearing from our food banks and from our churches and from our schools about rising hunger, particularly for kids. Can you speak mm -hmm. to what this budget sure. would do, um, or this CR would do, even for 31 days? Yeah, well, looking, we're looking at, it's about $462 million less uh, for the WIC program. You know, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of of people who will be jettisoned uh, from that program. You've got uh, 120, almost $124 million less uh, for food safety, for food prices, jobs in rural areas, and the out outcomes. Um, we, uh, it, it is, it, it's unbelievable that what we would do is to go down a road uh, with nutrition assistance, uh, which, which, would, it, it, which, is cut, which is cut severely. Uh, here and I don't know how that um, uh, re really is a, a part of looking at a, about saving saving money. You know, there are places that you can save money. You talked about people like to talk about the the the, the deficit as to the spending side of it, but the, uh, folks don't want to talk about the revenue side mm -hmm. and which we're short of revenue, which has to do with looking at the kind of tax breaks, tax you, you know, opportunities that we provide to the richest corporations, many of whom pay no tax at all in this, in this country, uh, let alone a fair share. They just mm -hmm. don't pay tax. Mm -hmm. So that the, the havoc that we would place, you're taking a look at uh, cutting back on, on, on vouchers for fruits and vegetables. You're looking at you, you know, uh, uh, serious, serious cuts to, uh, to, to, to nutrition. Uh, uh, programs, which make no, make, just don't make any sense uh, at all in terms of the health and the well-being of, of this, uh, of, of, of the country. And, you know, it is, um, we know how to negotiate appropriations. Mm -hmm. We know that you have to make cuts in some place. But we have been able to come together. You, you have cuts here to the National Institutes of Health. Mm -hmm. And the chairman and I have worked over the years to provide $11 billion for the NIH for life-saving biomedical research. Mm -hmm. This is not wasteful spending. We have come together on education programs and understanding the value of public education in this country. 
Do we have differences of opinion? Absolutely. And what the dollar amounts are. But we know that we have to address these issues. And the severity of the cuts, which would affect, uh, and part of what's affected in the agriculture sector, besides nutrition mm -hmm. and besides food safety, are what's happening to farmers. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed loans. It's $536 million less for direct and guaranteed farm ownership loans. They protect rural corporate broadband. Mm -hmm. And so necessary in, 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 in my state, but more so in rural parts of this country, are severely cut back. And it is at a minimum of 8.1%. In some areas, it's a lot more. OK. Um, you know, I, I know we've got to get down to votes. Vote so um, you know, I do find it very, very troubling, certainly based on the record thus far of the speaker being able to get appropriations and other bills to the floor. I don't think I'm willing to risk a hungry kid's uh, stomach for 31 days. Um, based on what we're seeing here. I do think it's encouraging that the Senate appropriators were able to come together and use the agreed upon spending limits. Um, and I find it really disappointing that the House has been unable well, to. Well, th that's the point, if I just may add. There was a fulsome, robust negotiation with regard to debt limit and to appropriations and to spending. Mm -hmm. And full disclosure, people may know here, I voted against the budget agreement. Not I, I would never have voted it for the nation to default, because we, I, you just don't do that or mm -hmm. hold it hostage. But however, I was very concerned about what was happening to appropriations bills. Mm -hmm. And that's what, and as a time ranking member of the full appropriations committee, to be advocating for these efforts, it just didn't seem that I could do that. But House passed it, Senate passed it, President signed it into law. It is the law of the land. Let's do what the Senate is doing. And I understand also, it was Congressman McHenry, who was part of those budget agreement negotiations, who said, you got people who want to go above the caps, below the caps. Let's adhere to the budget agreement. I'm there. I'm willing to fight it out there. And I voted against this agreement. So That's where we need to go. So am I correct that there was a vote, and you lost on the vote, but you were willing to abide by the results? Yes, because okay. it's the law With of that, the land. I would yield back. Thank you. Do we should go to vote? Uh, Quickly, uh, we're going to excuse and let everybody go, so we'll recess. At the beginning of the last vote, please cast your vote and come back. Members of the panel need to come back, and we'll resume at that point. Uh, so, uh, again, thank everybody for their cooperation. We'll thank see you. you shortly. Thank you. Uh, for the, without objection, the committee stands in recess subject to the call of the chair.